Labs OTR Visual Radio. I'm Mr. H. I'll be your host for this evening. Tonight's compilation is Gangbusters. This show was created by Philip H. Lord and aired on CBS from 1936 to 1940. Then from 1940 to 1948, it was on the Blue Network. In 1949, it returned to CBS until 1955. And then finally, from 1955 to 1957, the show was on the Mutual Broadcasting System. Tonight's episodes are from 1946 and 1947, and we've got some great episodes in this compilation, so we're in for an enjoyable evening. Just before we get into the action, I want to mention that Hearth and Home Entertainment is not an ad-supported channel. While YouTube is free, it does take a lot of time and money to keep a channel like this going. So we really appreciate your support help keep us on YouTube. If you would, take a minute to check out the links in the description below. Check out coffee.com, buymeacoffee.com, and patreon.com. And many of you have asked about using PayPal and coffee.com. The first option would be the best for you. Another great way you can support the channel is to check out the Hearth and Home Shop on Etsy. I've got a link for that down below as well. There you'll find a great assortment of old-time radio-themed goodies and maybe a Bigfoot shirt or two. Now, without any further ado, let's get on with the program. So it's time to sit back, relax, as we travel back in time to 1946 and 1947 to enjoy Gangbusters. And as always, thanks for tuning in. And now, in cooperation with police and federal law enforcement departments throughout the United States, the only national program that brings you authentic police case histories. Waterman's Pens and Waterman's Ink present Gangbusters! Tonight, the case of the death mask killer who used an innocent girl to cover his elaborate plans, but who learned that even the spending of three copper pennies could change the course of his life. Presenting facts in the endless war of the police on the underworld. Facts that show the operation of our law enforcement officials in their work of protecting our citizens. Commissioner Louis J. Valentine, on leave as interviewer of gangbusters, has now arrived in Tokyo, where he is to serve at the personal request of General Douglas MacArthur. Watermans expects to bring you his voice by shortwave in the near future. Meanwhile, Gangbusters has asked Dr. Carlton Simon of New York City, internationally known criminologist, to narrate by proxy tonight's case. Well, good Dr. Simon, I understand the criminal in tonight's case played a major part in the plot which led to a spectacular escape from Eastern Penitentiary last Easter. He did indeed, Don Gardner. This killer, Bow Wow Bowers, was cunning, shrewd, and merciless. His background must be of extreme interest to criminology, Dr. Simon. It certainly is, Dom. For the soundest way to combat crime is to know how the criminal's mind thinks and works. So I'm going to start tonight's case at a summer resort on a large lake in Wayne County, Pennsylvania. After dinner, a young couple was seated on a porch swing, looking out over the lake, which was brightened to silver by a full moon. Scranton never was like this, Horace. No? Eric never in Scranton. You'll have to come visit me sometime. She loved our family. I guess I would, Peggy, for anything like you. Look, baby, you and me, well, we made a lot of progress in three weeks. I... Yes, Horace? Well, there's not many women I'd give a second look. Take a long kiss. Oh, Oh, darling. Yeah? Do you really have to leave? I'll be back, Peggy, in a day or so. Oh, don't go, please. Believe me, baby, there's nothing I'd like better than staying here with you, but I ain't got to leave as soon as Andy comes downstairs. Oh, Andy. Why do you have a man like that working for me? He's Andy to have around. Andy drives a car, carries my samples, knows a lot of people. I still don't care much for it. Who takes you away from me? But I'll be back, baby. What? You'll be back tomorrow. You'll be here. Well, I should have left for home last week. You stick around, baby. Oh, there's Andy. Oh. We're late now. Uh, look, kid. There's nothing for you at home. Wait here for me. All right, Horace. Hurry back. So long, baby. 
Let's go, Andy. Right. You and that thing are what? Yeah, hold it. I'm going to tuck my shoe. What do you want to get involved with a dame for, Bowers? Ain't we got enough trouble? Every cop's Pennsylvania is not after us. That's the idea, Andy. I don't get it. Just in case, Peggy Foster's going to be our alibi. She's going to be our proof we were right here when the cops say we weren't. Yeah, uh, you couldn't get her to tell a lie, you know it, huh? Just give me another week or so and she'll jump into the lake if I have to, too. Yeah. Sure. Come on. Okay, if you say so. But I'd just like one look at her face when she finds out you're out of stay in the state. Shut up and hop in the car. Hey, I thought he wasn't taking this crate. Oh, in the world's far. We'll grab another car there. Oh, I got it. A double switch. Yeah. I got a nice Buick picked out. The owner won't miss for a week. Get going. I want to make the switch and take that nightclub in Easton before midnight. Attention, all police. Be on watch for two armed bandits in stolen black Buick sedan to leave fleeing north from Stroudsburg, Pennsylvania on Highway 611. Brutal gunmen identified as ex-convicts Bow Wow Powers and partner Andrioli held up five nightclubs and taverns vicinity Easton during past 48 hours. Blocked all roads. Authority, Captain Hall, Pennsylvania State Police. You want to see me, Captain Hall? Oh, Trooper Brodsky, sit down. Sit down. Yes, sir. Brodsky, this wave of assaults and holdups has got to be stopped. Well, at least we know who we're looking for. Yes, but where? The devil only knows what kind of a hideout Bowers is using now. You haven't got any leads, Captain? Almost none. Brodsky, I want you to take charge of the hunt. Just the chance I've been waiting for, Captain. Now you'll have to work in plain clothes. Of course. Haunt all the taverns and nightclubs in this area. Any scrap of information will help. I'd give a year's pay to catch him right-handed, Captain. So would I. You ever handled bars before, Brosky? Oh, yes, Captain. I questioned him for several hours before he was sent to penitentiary last time. Good. Then you'd know bars in sight. I couldn't miss him. Now be careful. Bowers would probably know you, too. Don't worry, Captain. All right, Brosky. You stay on this assignment until Bowers is put away for keeps. Oh, Peggy, the moon's still out on the lake? It's you, darling. <laughs> Miss me? I thought you'd be back here at the lake yesterday. I couldn't make it, Peggy, business. When are you coming back? Maybe tomorrow, maybe next week. Oh, hard. Now, look, kid, I got an idea. Why don't you drive down to Wilkes Bar and meet me? Well, all right, where? Well, Boulevard Inn's a nice, quiet place. Suppose you meet me there tomorrow night, uh, about 11. Boulevard Inn, Wilkes Bar. Yeah, I'll see you there about 11 tomorrow night. Don't stand me up. I won't, darling. Bye. Bye. Now, where is this dame, Paula? She's an hour late already. How are we going to use her for an alibi? Shut up, will you, Andy? I'm sore enough without you rubbing it in. Stop putting nickels in that jukebox. Yes, you got to play around with a dame. Why pick on one like that? Peggy's class, that's why. Okay, she's class. How long do you think she'd stick around if she knew who you were? She'd stick. Don't make me laugh, Bowers. Just look at that moon in your eyes from the summer recently. Shut up. I know what I'm doing. Yeah. You sure you told her Boulevard Inn? That's the name of this joint, ain't it? Boulevard Inn? That's what I told her. Look, Bowers, it's risky enough coming to this joint, much less waiting around for an hour. Where is this day? Something could have happened. Peggy don't show up in five minutes. I'm gonna phone her. Trooper Brosky, Captain. Oh, anything new on Bowers, Brosky? I've been to a lot of clubs and taverns, didn't learn much. I got a report a little while ago, Brosky. Two nightclubs held up early tonight, just across New Jersey line. Bowers? Looks like his work. I'll take your report over the phone, Brosky. Well, it's too dark to read my notes in this booth, Captain. Besides, there's a guy outside pacing up and down like a tiger waiting to use the phone. Must be expecting twins or something. Well, where are you, Brosky, in case I want to reach you? Please call the Boulevard Inn in Wilkes-Barre. Boulevard Inn and Wilkes-Barre. Right, okay. Let the other fella have the phone. Maybe it's triplets. <laughs> right, Captain. Oh, 
Okay, mister, the phone's all yours. About the sign forward. Stop it. Now, you don't touch her. Oh, oh. Well, stop her. All right. The next guy that moves gets the same treatment. Line up over there. This is a stick-up. Every police officer in northeastern Pennsylvania joined in the hunt for the killers of Trooper John Broski. But police were stymied, Don, until they saw a young boy spend three cents in Philadelphia. Well, before you tell us the significance of this, Dr. Simon, here's a word. Scent House, we help alcoholics. If you or you have a friend who drinks so much that... Your drinking is destroying our marriage. Sir, would you mind getting out of your car? Mary, the meeting is at 2.30. Mommy, when is Daddy coming home? Alice, you're fired! Renison House, we can help. We've been there. Come and live in here for a month, and we'll help you live out there for the rest of your life. Renaissance Alcoholism Treatment Center, 488-5176. Now back to gangbusters in the case of Bow Wow Bowers. Now, Dr. Simon, just how did the Pennsylvania State Police go about their search for the murderer of Trooper Brodsky? Well, Don, Captain Hall took charge of the investigation at the Wilkes-Barre headquarters of the State Police. About an hour after the murder, Sergeant Haynes reported to Captain Hall on one phase of the investigation. Get the young lady outside, Captain. What's her name, Sergeant? Peggy Foster, sir. I checked on her. Comes from good people in Stratton. Mm. Peggy Foster, huh? She know why she's here? Uh, not yet, sir. All right, bring her in. Yes. All right, miss. In here, please. I wish you'd tell me why I'm here. This is ridiculous. I didn't even see the shooting. Captain Hall, this is Miss Peggy Foster. How do you do? Captain, would you mind explaining all this to me? Would you sit down, Miss Foster? All right, but I still don't... Sit what? down, please, won't you? <laughs> now, uh, <clears throat> would you explain exactly what you were doing at the Boulevard Inn tonight? Of course I'll explain. I'm a guest at a summer resort in Wayne County. I was to meet another guest, Mr. Burns. Mr. Horace Burns at the Boulevard Inn at 11 o'clock. But you didn't arrive until after midnight, five minutes after the shooting. I had a flat tire on the way. I had to change it myself. Look at my clothes. When you came into the tavern and learned there was a murder, you became hysterical. When I didn't see Mr. Burns, the thought suddenly struck me that he was the one who'd been killed. You didn't know it was Trooper Brusky? Somebody finally told me. Then you never did see this Mr. Burns at the tavern? No, sir. I don't know what could have happened to him. Miss Foster, would you take a look at this photograph? Certainly. Is that Mr. Burns? Yes, that's Horace. But this number, why the number? What do you think? He's no criminal. He killed Trooper Brusky. No. He's wanted for 24 recent holdups. He couldn't, not Horace. Miss Foster, it's true. No, no. I... Now look, please, Miss Foster, please try to help us. All right, Captain Bill, I'll try. Your Mr. Burns is really Horace Bowers. He's a killer. There must be a mistake. He was so nice to me. Oh, no. Miss Foster, I'm afraid he wasn't sincere. He was using you for an alibi. Oh, no. no. Now, in the weeks that Bowers saw you, he may have unconsciously told you many things. Little things that may help us find oh. Now, we'd like to start asking you questions. Little questions. All right, Captain. Now, Miss Foster, when did you first meet Bowers? The day I registered at the lake, two weeks ago. How was he dressed? Very smartly. He always liked to dress well. Did you see his luggage? How many suitcases was he carrying? I don't remember them. What else did Bowers have to drink? Nothing, only two highballs. What time did he leave the next day? Ten. I think it was ten. What was he wearing? Um, that jacket, I think. Did he leave Andreoli behind when he drove away that day? No, sir. I think Andreoli was... Always commenting about the noises trains make near his home, you see. Yes, yes, always. In Philadelphia? Yes, Philadelphia. Is this North Philadelphia? Yes, 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 North Philadelphia. And Boris said he was heading for Philadelphia as soon as he left this part of the country. Yes. And the last time you heard from Bowers was when he called you tonight. That was the last time, yes. Well, I think that's all for now. 
And we're very much obliged, Miss Forster. Thank goodness. Thank you very much, Miss Forster. Sorry we had to question you so long. You can go now and get some rest. Sergeant and I have some work. All right, Captain Hall. Good night. Well, Captain, what's our first move? Well, from what the girl said, Bowers apparently sees a lot of Philadelphia. Bowers knows we're hotter after him than than ever, Captain. He'll have a good hideout. He won't show his face outside. Well, it won't be easy. But did the girl's answers convey any particular quirks to you about Bowers' personality? He seems pretty vain. And curious. Right. So? He would be especially curious about the progress of our investigation into Trooper Brusky's murder. You mean he'll read the newspapers? Exactly. And the most detailed accounts will be carried in the wilkes papers. And Bowers will want to see them most of all. I think you've got it, Captain. I'll put an immediate cover on every stand in Philadelphia that handles out-of-town newspapers. Captain Hall speaking. Sergeant Haynes, Captain. I think we've located Bowers. Good. An hour ago, a young boy bought yesterday's wilkes and paper at the main newsstand in North Philadelphia. The railroad station? Yes, sir. Boy's never been near wilkes Bar. He was buying a paper for someone else. Bowers? From the description, yes. He's at the Palm Manor Apartments. Two men are covering the place now. Get set for a raid immediately, Sergeant. We'll see if we can put a muzzle on this power, Bowers. <laughs> Then posted on all street corner, Sergeant. You got the block surrounded, Captain. Good. On a night like this, Bowers might slip out through the storm. This is the house, Captain. Come on. Some doors open. The apartment at the end of the hall. We may run into gunfire and I'll be ready for anything. Who is it? The janitor. The water's leaking down into the basement from your apartment. Just a second. Get set to move fast now. Guns out, yes. Powers, get your hands up. Watch that. Don't oh, move, Andrioli. Come you dumb. Come along, you two. You're wanted for murder. Bowers and Andrioli were tried promptly for the murder of State Trooper Broski, Don, and both received life sentences in Eastern State Penitentiary, Philadelphia. In prison, Bowers was assigned to the corner cell of the 10th cell block. He became sullen and moody. At night, when the other convicts were asleep, Bowers paced his cell, brooding and thinking. Hey, Bowers, for Pete's sake, will you stop that walking up and down? How can other guys sleep? I shut up. You act like you was going stir crazy. I'm getting out of this can. Who's going to boost you over the wall? The one? I ain't going over the wall. Oh, no? No, under it. Huh? Yeah. A tunnel. Oh, you're nuts. The guards would spot a tunnel in no time. You gotta have camouflage. I got it all worked out. Any con can get permission to build a bookcase in his cell, right? And the shelf. So what? So we'll build that bookcase. Then all we need is some plaster and some water. That's for the rest of the camouflage. Uh, now I know you're nuts. No, no, I've been reading a magazine. There was a picture of it. A picture of a death mask. A death mask? You, you mean one of them plaster casts that they make of your face and your head? Yeah. We build a tunnel right from this cell here. The bookcase will cover up the tunnel so nobody can see it. The death masks and some stuff bunched up under the covers will make the guards think it's us sleeping. While we're really digging the tunnel. Ah, uh, you forget one little thing, Bowers. What? The dirt. What do we do with the dirt from the tunnel? Easy. Lots of times during the day all the cells are open and us cons can come and go. We get a dozen guys in on this. We give them the dirt they carry out in their hats, their pockets, paper bags, anything. And they dump it around the grounds. Us birds will be flying out of this cage before you know it. Okay, God's gone. Get 
get out of your bed. Yeah, but let's help me move this bootcase. All right. We get out? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Crumb, that's him. I'll fix the bookcase back in place and arrange the death mask. The way things are going, Powers, we ought to break through with another couple of nights while he got that talk and crawl in there before the guard comes back. Hurry up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Mother guards and myself just noticed something this evening in the grounds around the prison buildings that looks rather suspicious. Yes? There's some spots in the yard where it looks like fresh earth has been stamped into the ground. Fresh earth, eh? Yeah. You mean only one thing? Convicts digging a tunnel somewhere and trying to dispose of the dirt they take out. Order an immediate search. The cell blocks in every building in the prison. every hour right through the night. Okay. Flash your light into the cell. Nah. Most convicts sound asleep. We'll try the next one. The death mask. Look there, under the bookcase. A tunnel. Yeah. Get out in the alarm. I'll watch here. They aren't still in the tunnel. They didn't get very far. They found out awful quick, Bob. Well, lucky it's still dark. Keep running, sir. We need a car. Quick. Run, run. We'll get a car. Hey, look. Come on. Say, hey, mother cops stopped me back there. They, they, you guys ain't cops. I'd your guess it, brother. Okay. Right. Get out of the truck. Try any funny stuff and you'll get this knife in the throat. Yes, sir. Quick. Yes, sir. Oh. 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 That'll keep the driver quiet. All right, guys, climb aboard. Right, Come on. One move and you get the same thing. 
Bowers recovered from his wound, Don, and he and the other men who participated in that break last April the 3rd are back in Eastern State Penitentiary. Well, that certainly was quick work on the part of the Pennsylvania police, Dr. Simon. And I can see what you mean by the necessity of knowing how the criminal mind thinks and acts in combating crime. Thank you for a fine case, Dr. Simon. And now, Gangbusters! Gangbusters, presented in cooperation with police and federal law enforcement departments throughout the United States. The only national program that brings you authentic police case histories. Tonight's Gangbusters case. A special presentation. Inside facts, dramatized for the first time on the Battle of Alcatraz. Just one week ago, the law-abiding citizens of America, slowly recovering from four long years of war, were shocked to hear of a new battle on a 12-acre island in San Francisco Bay. The Battle of Alcatraz. Alcatraz. So named in 1775 by the Spanish settlers of California, Isla de Alcatraces, the island of the pelicans, a heap of rocks jutting up into the Golden Gate, a mile and a half northeast of San Francisco's famous waterfront district. For nearly 100 years, the island of the pelicans has been a prison, first as disciplinary barracks for military offenders of the United States Army. For the last 13 years... The place of confinement selected by the United States Department of Justice for discipline, segregation, punishment of the most desperate and hopelessly incorrigible criminals. For 280 convicts, the rock is the last stop before hell. Last week, there was trouble on the rock. Five dead, 16 wounded. <laughs> Was the revolt of the nation's most desperate criminal spontaneous? Was it the result of a moment's opportunity, or was it the result of years of meticulous planning? Four years ago, in the summer of 1942, at another federal penitentiary on McNeil Island in the state of Washington, a veteran convict, a notorious dealer in accurate grapevine information, walked up to a guard who was on duty in the prison kitchen. You better get back to slicing those apples, Tom. Yeah, sure, but can I say a word to you, mister? Okay. What is it? Hey, look. I got the dope. You're up for a transfer to Alcatraz. You're going to be a guard on the rock. So what? You're headed for trouble. What gives you that idea? I wouldn't be telling you, except you've been a pretty square guy with us cons. Well, maybe I can do you a favor. Don't take the job on the rock, mister. No? Why not? Don't take it, that's all. It's going to be a big break there. Maybe a long time coming, but when it does, it'll be a regular massacre. A massacre? <laughs> Don't make me laugh. A massacre on the rock? Impossible. Alcatraz is escape proof. Silence at all times in the cell house. Cell bars are tool proof alloys. Photoelectric cells that detect even the smallest pin. Machine guns. Concrete walls. A 20-foot cyclone fence topped with barbed wire. Then the water. A mile of treacherous tidal currents, you see. Alcatraz is escape-proof. What makes you think so, bud? Let me tell you something. That con up at McNeil Island has the right dope. He ought to get a knife between the ribs for cracking his yet. Shut up, will you? I'm telling this guy something. Okay, okay. You see, this big building is right next to the water. We figure once we get out and take care of the tower gardens, we'll have our pick of the boats at the dock. Oh, you're wasting your time. No one escapes from Alcatraz. You couldn't even begin. Wasting our time, huh? 
We got lots of it to waste. What's time? And where could we begin? Show him the handkerchief. Yeah. Yeah, here it is. See that handkerchief? That little rag. That's what we'll use to crank out of Alcatraz. That's what'll whip your machine guns and the steel bars and the electric eyes. We'll tie a knot in the handkerchief. We'll use it to reach through the bars and pick up a pair of pliers from a workman's kit. Oh, it'll take time, lots of time. But we got plenty of time. And with the pliers, we loosen some plumbing. And when we get ready to use the pipes, we put them all together with the pliers. And we got a nice little gadget that spreads bars like they was paper. Also a nice little gadget to bump some guards over the skull. Okay. So here's how we got it figured. You see, this big cell house has four cell blocks. A, B, C, and D running the whole length of the building. Now, the only guy with guns is a guard that walks in what they call a gun gallery. And this gun gallery runs across the end of the cell house. It's really a catwalk stuck on the end of the building, but separated from the cell tiers by iron bars. Well, this guard walks back and forth in the gun gallery looking things over. We take care of this guard. We're sitting pretty. Don't forget about the guns. Yeah, yeah. This guard is always carrying a rifle, a sweet little forty-five automatic. Now, Bernie Croy and another con got the job sweeping up the corridors between the cell block and the gun gallery. Once in a while, Coy manages to climb up and give the bars to the gun gallery a little spread so they can squeeze through. And the idea is, get the guns and stick up the floor guards who got no guns. And it's all set. I guess it's around two in the afternoon that they're going to squeeze through and lay for this guard. It was a tight squeeze, Coy. I didn't think you'd make it. I did, didn't I? Boy, if I'd been waiting for this. As soon as the guard passes, I'll grab him, slug him, and I'll grab his guns. Shh, he's coming. Now, hey, slug him, right? I'll get the cell block keys and let you other guys out. You got him? Got the keys. Uh, I got the keys. Uh, get his guns, too. We're going to make it all right. I'll let Tretz and you other guys out. Okay, come on. Shut up, you guys. Shut up. Okay, we'll get the key to the outside door. Tell me how quick the thing's cooked, I say. All right. We counted on this guard having a key to let us outside the cell house. Okay, he didn't. But we got his guns and we got a fighting chance. Well, I ain't giving up. Me neither. Okay. All right, would you? How do we wake it? All right. We make some noise, see, and the other guards will come running. They won't expect nothing. Yeah, one of them ought to have the outside keys. A dozen or more dangerous criminals now have the appetizer to their meal of freedom. They are out of their cells and armed. But without the keys to the outside door, their chances of full freedom are hopeless, and they know it. In the meantime, the four o'clock shift of guards is in a locker room in the same building adjacent to the troubled cell tiers. Changing into their uniforms, about to go on duty... These relief guards who carry no guns have no idea that a score or more desperate convicts are free and armed on the other side of a heavy steel door. Hold it, fellas. Huh? Quiet. Just a minute. Well, what's up, Harry? Shh. Hear that noise through the door? Yeah. From the cell blocks. Yeah. Come on. Let's have a look. All right. Yeah. I'll get the door. Hey, it's quieted down. Yeah. Come on. Come on. Hey, look. This first cell. It's empty. Hey. Hey, watch it. Watch it. Watch it. They're loose. Right into the cell. Oh, they got me again. All right, the rest of you. Act dead. Right. Hey. Oh, 
open that cell door, Coy. Okay. See if those guards got the keys. All you guys start searching them. They all look dead. Now. Well, search them. If we're getting out, we need those keys. Hey, there's one still kicking. Let me add him. Hey, you. Oh. Give me the keys of the outside. I have no keys. Oh, you haven't, huh? Oh. That's for not having the keys, and this is for nothing. Hey, Kretzer. Yeah? The other guys ain't got no keys either. Huh? Oh. Looks like we're cooked, guys. Maybe we've got a call of quits. Well... What do the rest of you guys say? No, no, no. Okay, we fight it out. We can't get out one way, we'll take the other, right? Well, I'm with you, Kretzer. Head up, boy, Thompson. Who else? Help me. Okay. okay. Let's think this out a little. From the warden, United States Penitentiary, Alcatraz Island, to the United States Navy, Coast Guard, and San Francisco Police Department... Serious trouble has broken out. Convicts are armed and at large in the cell house. I have issued a riot call and placed armed guards at strategic locations. Most of our officers are imprisoned in the cell house. 3.18 p.m. To the Commandant, San Francisco Naval Base. Subject, Alcatraz Riot. One, dispatch immediately one company U.S. Marines to assist Warden, United States Penitentiary, Alcatraz Island. Two, assign all available patrol craft to surround and maintain constant vigilance, Alcatraz Island. Signed, Commandant, 12th Naval District. All Thursday night, May 2nd, the traces of the attackers and the ping of bullets of the besieged streak the sky over the Golden Gate. The battle rages without let-up. Residents of San Francisco line the waterfront to see firsthand what they had heard in the special broadcasts and in the papers. People throng in fascination, for death is the label on each of the bullets which line the sky in blood red. On the Great Golden Gate Bridge, a sailor and his girl edge to the railing. What are those red streaks? Fireworks? Those are the bullets, baby. Tracer bullets. Gee, there are a lot of them. I don't understand it. If they haven't got a chance, what are those convicts fighting for? I don't know, baby. They probably figure they'll get electrocuted or something anyhow, so maybe they'd rather do it this way. I wonder who they are. Not very nice to know. I guarantee you that. You know, I feel kind of sorry for them. Well, anyway, all those tracer bullets and everything, it's pretty. Yes, young lady, very pretty. And who are the men, those prisoners of other men, decent men? Who are those convicts trying to blast their way to a freedom that could mean nothing but more violence and more bloodshed? Those men for whom you feel kind of sorry. Listen. Joseph Paul Kretzer, murder. They also robbed banks, 15 or 16. I forget which. Myra and Edgar Thompson. I killed a cop. Morris Franklin Hobbit. Me, I shot a cop too. Kidnapped another one. Bernard Ball Coy. I'm on the rock for robbing a bank. This is my fourth time over. Lawrence Carnes, murderer, kidnapper. Sam Shockley, kidnapper, bank robber, escape artist. Those are six of the men. Six of the ringleaders. Six desperate killers. In a moment, you'll learn how they came to be inmates of the rock. Now, back to gangbusters and tonight's special dramatization of the Battle of Alcatraz. <laughs> The list of 280 Alcatraz convicts recalls murder, bank robbery, kidnapping with each name. High up the list, and the murderer of Alcatraz guard, William H. Miller, stands... Joseph Paul Kretzer, Alcatraz, number 548. Wanted on warrants, charging more than a dozen bank robberies, Kretzer and a woman companion sped through the streets of Michigan City, Indiana, on the early morning of June 7th, 1939. Aren't you going to make a run for it? Me? Run from the cops? <laughs> we are not going 
gonna let him take you. Watch. Give me that gun. I get it. Here he comes. Let's go, Ben. Right. Do you think you killed him? I don't know, and I don't care. But every cop we meet is going to learn the same thing. Joe Crutcher's one guy, they're never going to stop. The Federal Bureau of Investigation traced Kretzer through acquaintances of this gun mall to an apartment on Chicago's north side and arrested him. He was sent to McNeil Island Penitentiary for 25 years. A year or so later, he escaped, but was recaptured. With his accomplice, Kretzer was in the ante room of federal court in Tacoma, awaiting trial for escape. Be here for us in a minute, Kyle. Yeah, Kretzer? Look, I ain't going back to no solitary. Yeah? There'll be two of them. You take one and I'll take the other. Go for the guns. Hey, look, Kretzer, that's suicide. I'm so not... what? It's better than rotting away the rest of your life. Okay, I'm with you. Shh, shh, shh. They're coming. All right, Kretzer. All right, let's go. Okay, okay, don't rush it. Now! Oh, what are you doing? They've got no guns. All right, let's go. Right! and his companion got only to the end of the corridor. There they were subdued by other federal officers. The United States Marshal, struck down by Kretzer, was killed by a blow to the head. Thus, Joseph Paul Kretzer came to Alcatraz for life, for murder. Bernard Paul Coy, number 415. I'm Coy. I'm a bank robber who didn't like being caught. They sent me to Leavenworth for 25 years. They expected me to sit down and wait those 25 years. I showed those guys I was too tough for Leavenworth. Thus, Bernard Paul Coy came to Alcatraz. Marvin Franklin Hubbard, number 645. I'm Hubbard. I broke out of prison three times in Oklahoma and Idaho. The last time a cop tried to stop us near Chattanooga, Tennessee... Instead of the cop taking us in, we took the cop along. Then we ran into a bunch of cops. I shot one, but they nabbed us. Thus, Marvin Franklin Hubbard came to Alcatraz. Myron Edgar Thompson, number 729. I'm Thompson. I killed a cop, I kidnapped three people, and I broke out of jail eight times. You ever hear of Blackie Thompson? Well, he was a Texas bad man. He was my brother, see. The cops at Amarillo got him. I hate Amarillo cops. Yes, Myron Thompson claimed Blackie Thompson as his brother and swore vengeance on the Amarillo police. About a year ago, shortly after his last jailbreak, Thompson and a companion were driving toward Amarillo. See that curve right ahead there? Yeah, what about it, Thompson? Right there is where my brother Blackie Thompson was killed by the Amarillo cops. Yeah? Yeah. He shot the tires off his car. He jumped out, but the cops mowed him down. Got 30 slugs in him. Laying right there. I hate cops. But I hate Amarillo cops most. And one of them's in for the surprise of his life. Standing by our car, Thompson. He's a cop, all right. And I'm a really cop. Here, you just keep going. I'll walk right up to him. Just a moment, you two. Oh, he, you speaking to us? You strangers here in Amarillo, aren't you? Oh, I, sure. Is this your car? Well, we borrowed it from a friend. It's got stolen plates on it. Oh, it has. Turn around. <laughs> I got no gun. We'll see about that. Hey, see, I, I told you. Yeah. You'll have to go up to headquarters anyway. 
answer a few questions. Okay. Anything you say. Headquarters only up about three blocks. Uh, Amarillo seems to be a pretty good little town. Yeah, there's nice folks in this town. This like is a pistol in your ribs, copper. Where'd you get that gun? I got it, that's all. And I hate Amarillo cops. Oh, oh. I got the wheel. Good. I'll sell them out, Cotton. Look, you dumped him right in front of the police station. Hey, I thought he searched you. Yeah, he did. He didn't find that pistol. Go on, give her the gas. Yeah. Well, Amarillo cop kills Blackie. And I kill an Amarillo cop. A short time later, Myra and Edgar Thompson kidnapped a young woman and two servants and transported them across the New Mexico state line where he was apprehended. Thus, Myra and Edgar Thompson came to Alcatraz. Those are the ringleaders, the desperate criminals who control most of the inside of Alcatraz's impregnable cell house, armed with a variety of weapons. Two hundred odd prisoners not participating in the revolt are herded into the prison yard under the guard of the machine guns of the United States Marines. Navy and Coast Guard boats patrol the island. Join the Navy and see the world. Yeah, and look at us. We circle out the trans so many times, I'm dizzy already. And you'd think those cons would have better sense. You know, they know they ain't got a chance. Yeah, they remind me of the Japs, in a way. Yeah? Oh, there they go again. Oh, look at them tracers. Well, I'll take my word for it. I'm glad I'm not up on that rock. I had enough people shooting at me the last four years. Thursday night, 7.35 p.m. Prisoners continue to hold possession. Two guards wounded in attempt to storm stronghold. Friday, 4.35 a.m., special load of fragmentation bombs and other modern warfare equipment arrives in Alcatraz Island from Benesis Arsenal. Guards launch vigorous assault. By mid-morning on Friday, the entrenched convicts are still holding out. The order is given to drill holes in the roof of the cell house over cell block D, built as escape proof, but conversely, proving attack proof. Through the roof, Alcatraz guards and Pacific veterans of the United States Marine Corps drop hand grenades. It's getting pretty hot, boys. Yeah, I told you we shouldn't go through. Yeah, this is better than the electric chair. You can stay that again, Kretzer. Hey, outside the window. Get the feed on him. Good shot. Hey, hey, that grenade was close. So close. The battle continues with varying intensity all Friday night. But Saturday morning dawns quietly over Alcatraz. The lull continues. It is deathly still. Shortly after noon, Saturday, May 4th, it is decided to storm the bastion. Armed guards, some flown in from Leavenworth and McNeil Island. Volunteers from San Quentin approach a steel door. None knows what inferno awaits him on the other side of that steel door. All right. Open it up. All right. When they start shooting, men, jump for cover. Okay. Let's go. Guns ready. There's one. Drop. <laughs> He's not moving. I'll crawl up to him. It's Kretzer. He's dead. There's two more dead. Hey, guards! We surrender! 
We give up. We give up. We give up. We surrender. 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 Quiet, all of you. We give up. All right, march out of here with your hands over your head. And then when you try the trick, you'll get shot. Now, come out. Thus ends the Battle of Alcatraz. Casualties. Five dead. Sixteen seriously wounded. The dead, William H. Miller, guard. Lieutenant Harold P. Stites, guard. Joseph Paul Cripsy, convict. Bernard Paul Coy, convict. Marvin Franklin Hubbard, convict. At least three other convicts face execution on charges of murder. A week later, Alcatraz Island, an establishment of the United States government for the confinement and punishment of the most dangerous criminals, with no attempt at rehabilitation, is quiet. And any time, anywhere, when you were buying a fountain pen or when you were buying ink, Always look for the name Waterman. Gangbusters is a Phillips H. Lord production. Federal law enforcement departments throughout the United States, the only national program that brings you authentic police case history. Gangbusters. And now to gangbusters and facts that show the operation of our law enforcement officials in their war against the underworld. Gangbusters has asked Chief J.A. Pitcock, who recently retired as Chief of Police, Little Rock, Arkansas, after 31 years of service, to narrate by proxy tonight's case. The inside facts in the case of the costume killer. Chief Pitcock, from what you've told me, I know tonight's case is so fantastic, the facts about this criminal are hard to believe. Yes, Don Gardner, but I've got his signed confession to murder right here in my hand. Well, when did you first hear of this man, Chief Pitcock? Well, Don, our reports start not too many months ago in the city of Paragold, Arkansas. A tall, slim man about 40 had been sitting in the front parlor of his rooming house. He'd heard a knock at the door and he was on his way to answer it. All right, all right. Come on, Mr. Oswey. Well, come in, come in, Joy. Don't stand there like a tired old field horse. Yes, sir. Look, Mr. Oswey, don't be sorry at me because I... Don't tell me here. Come on in the parlor. Yeah. Sheets. Spend your days and nights trying to pound a little something in their pumpkin head so maybe they'll amount to something. Get in there. Yes, sir. Well, what are you going to tell me, boy? Get it out of here. I think he wasn't born with a tongue. I tried, Mr. Oswe. Honest, I tried. Sit down. Yes, sir. Now, you got to listen to me, boy. For years, I've been showing kids how to do this. Kids, they all think they're smarter than you. Oh, I don't think I'm smarter than you, honest. Uh, well, if you listened close to me and done exactly like I told you, you wouldn't have had no experience like that. I tried, Mr. Oswe. You didn't do it like I told you. You didn't do a thing I told you. Oh, I was awfully scared. That cop came pretty close, awful close. Well, if you'd listened to me and if you'd opened the window like I showed you how to open it, you'd have been in there and out. With a stack full of stuff. Before that cop even got close. Yes, sir. I guess I would, but... But nothing. I got boys all over this city and lots of other cities. I showed them what to do and how to do it. Now, me and you are going back to that store tonight. And me and you are going to come home with a gunny sack full of stuff. Yes, sir. And then after we get that, I'm going to show you a few other things. How to disguise yourself up good so nobody can pick you out. How to pick a lock with just a hairpin. How to break a man's arm with just one twist. Do I have to learn that? Of course you got to learn that, boy. Sometimes you got to hurt people. 
Sometimes when you don't hurt people, you get hurt yourself. And hurt bad. Did you ever hurt anyone? Only because I had to. Bad? Bad enough. I killed him. Killed him? Uh, only two. Oh. oh. That's what I did my time for. And if I'd killed the third one, I wouldn't done no time at all. But I got soft-hearted. Serves me right. Now, never you get soft-hearted, boy. Oh, no, sir. Now, you listen to me. And I'll tell you how we're going to get in that store tonight. Maybe you ought to use the glass cutter some more. Shh, boy. You got it. Sure, I got it. Okay, Joey, I'll give you a boost up. You unlock the window. Yeah. Now grab a hold. Okay. Now, up you go. Okay, now. Reach in. Unlock the window. Yes, sir. Wait a minute. A little higher. Yeah. Okay. Okay, I got it. Good boy. Now, come on down. If you hadn't did it like this last night, we wouldn't have all this bother tonight. You got your gunny sack? Yes, sir. Okay. I'm going to boost you in. You know what to take. And when you get it, you meet me back the room. Ain't you coming in with me? There ain't but one way to learn, boy, and that's do it yourself. But Mr. Osterman... Don't stand there arguing with me. Now, come here, I'll boost you. It ain't fair. Now, up you go. Oh, gee, that's enough. Now, jump down. Everything all right? Yeah, I think so. Good boy. I'll see you back the room. All right, all right, I'm coming. Joy? Yeah, it's me. Just a second. Come in, boy. Yes, sir. Oh, man, good work, boy. You did fine. You... Where's the gunny sack? I got it, Mr. Ostry. I left it in the shed. Well, I told you to bring it so I could give you what you got coming. I was gonna, but... But, but what, boy? Speak we... up. There was a cop waiting in front of my house. A cop? It's a good thing I saw him, Mr. Ostry. An awful good thing. You snitch. You... Please, Mr. Ostry, let you... me go. I... I didn't have anything to do with it. What's he doing there, then? I don't know. I'll... Huh? Let me go. <laughs> All right, boy. If this cop's waiting for you, that ain't good. What do we do? Well, I'll tell you, boy. Uh, you go on home and get to bed. But the cop will That don't me. matter none, boy. You got no record. You get off easy. But I don't want to go to jail. I don't want to. I'll just give you a talking to. With me, it's sight different. I'm on parole. They send me back to prison for life. You wouldn't want that to happen to your old friend Slim Usley, would you? Oh, no, sir. I wouldn't. Well, now you see why I got to leave town. Anyway, I got some some of my other boys to look in on. Uh, I'll be in touch with you, boy. You'll hear from me. You're a good boy. So, Don, Slim Usry, a parole murderer and tutor in crime, fled to his native town of Hattiesburg, Mississippi, where he sought refuge at the home of his sister Etta. But Slim Usry's sojourn in Hattiesburg didn't prove as pleasant as he had hoped. Slim? Slim! Slim! Yeah, what's ailing you now? I asked you to weed the garden. Instead, you sit there all day like you were a landlord waiting for his rent. If you want the garden, weed it, weed it yourself. I ain't budging, Etta. I ain't budging an inch. Honest, Slim, it just ain't right. If I feel like it, Etta, I'll sit here all week. I don't know how many times I have to tell you, Slim. You ought to be out working like other men. Now, looky here, Etta. If there was work I felt like doing, I'd be out doing it. There ain't no kind of work around this town I feel like doing. Can't you get that through your head? If you don't work, you're blown back in the penitentiary. Now, look here, Etta. I said the penitentiary. Don't you talk to me like that, Etta. The whole town's talking about you. They all know what you are. I got to bear the shame. Who cares? I could see that you're sent back to jail. You shut up, you oh, old pig. No, no. <laughs> Why should I dirty my hands on you? Fine home you give your own brother, always nagging. Don't know when to stop. <laughs> Guess it was a mistake taking you in. More of a mistake not coming back. I guess you better leave, Slim. I reckon I best. I want you to be packed when I get home. Yeah. What time are you coming back? I won't be back till late tonight. Hey. What? Who's going to fix my supper? Nobody. You're not eating here again. Hey, Edda. You old hen. You ain't sending me back no penitentiary. You ain't even going to think about sending me back. 
That, Don, was the moment Slim Usry made up his mind to murder his sister Etta. He knew she would walk home that night, and he waited in the clump of weeds until he heard her footsteps. Etta? Howdy, Etta. You have a nice time? Oh, Slim, you scared me. Did I, Etta? What were you doing back in those weeds? Did you did you lose something? No. I'm just fixing to lose something, that's all. But what do you mean? Nothing, Edda, nothing at all. Are you all, all packed to go? I, I don't want you in my house tonight. I changed my mind, that I'm staying. Who, who said so? I said so, that's who. No, not in my house. No? You, if you don't go tonight, I'm calling the police. You call him, Edda, you call him. Slim, no, 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 no. Oh, hand. Try to send me back to the tension, will you? Oh, you little traitor brother. You... <clears throat> You old hen. I'll show you. Treat your brother like a wooden dog. Take care of you. Deputy Sheriff Clarkson. Deputy Clarkson, this is Slim Osry. Yes, Slim. Hi. It's my sister, Edda, Deputy Clarkson. She she left the house yesterday to go visiting. She didn't come home all night. Where'd she go, Slim? Well, I don't rightly know, Deputy Clarkson. But you know, Edda, that ain't like her. Something must have happened to her now. Would, would you help me find her? All right, Slim, I'll be right over. So, Don, the murderer, Slim Usry, reported to the authorities that his sister, Etta, was missing. Although it was Usry himself who killed her. But in carrying out his plan to fool the police, Usry ran into unexpected difficulties. Okay, let's break right here. More from Gangbusters right after these messages on 670 WMAQ. George Burns and Gracie Allen. Austin Blackie. Edgar Bergen. John and Blanche Bickerson. This is Stan Freeberg. Would you pay $60 for 60 of the greatest old-time radio shows of all time? Well, now you can by ordering Old Time Radio's Greatest Shows, a 60-episode collection for only $60. The Whistler, Gangbusters, Philip Marlowe, Gunsmoke, and many more. All on top quality cassettes housed in a designer case. Plus, you also receive a 20-page anecdotal booklet giving you the inside story to each and every show. Hold everything, Stan. This is Carl Amari, owner of Radio Spirits, with a special limited time offer. If listeners call right now and mention this radio station, they can take $10 off the $60 price. But you must call right now and mention this radio station for this special $10 savings. Hey, you don't have to convince me. Order toll for 1-800-RADIO-48. That's 1-800-723-4648. It's time for Internet Jeopardy. I'll take Internet Service Provider for 100. They're the fastest growing Internet access company in Chicagoland. Who is Techport? You're correct. You control the board. I'll take technical support for 500. The company with free 24-hour support. Who is Techport? Right again. Still your turn. Give me Internet Best Buys for 1000 Bob. Now listen closely. They're the company which offers unlimited Internet access, a free homepage for new subscribers, email, and free setup for only one low fee of $19.95 per month. Plus, the first 30 days are free. Who is Techport? Right again. Now, if you answer this next question correctly, you'll double your money and walk away the new Internet Jeopardy champion. How can people sign up with Techport Complete Internet Access? That's easy, Bob. They call 1-800-830-4880 or log on to www.techinter.com. Congratulations. You're our new Internet Jeopardy champion. And remember, Techport is your best source for complete Internet access. Phone 800-830-4880. Now, let's get back to gangbusters. Now, you were telling us, Chief Pitcock, that Slim Usry murdered his sister, Etta, and then reported her missing. Yes, Don. And an investigation was started. The weeded area of the neighborhood was on the list of places where deputies thought the woman might be found, and the search there was in progress. Deputy Clarkson? Yes, Lynn. 
You don't reckon we find that in here? If anything happened, it would break my heart. I know how you feel, Slim. Let's cut the talk and look. Okay. Matter, uh, uh, Slim. Hey, boy. Hold it, man. Hold it. What's the matter? What's the matter? Did you find something, Slim? Uh, Good Lord. <laughs> I don't know. Come away from us, Slim. Come away. <laughs> I won't sleep a wink till I get the man did this. I won't sleep a wink. I'm in. Hello, Deputy Clarkson. Slim. They said you wanted to see me. Yes. Come on over and sit down. Sure, Deputy Clarkson. Well... You got any idea who killed my sis? Yes, Slim. I've got a few ideas. Well, you just tell me who it was. I could wring his neck with my two hands. I could... You could what, Slim? Well, you can't blame me none, Deputy Clarkson. Holy letter, never did no harm, no one. Murdered in cold blood like that. You killed two men yourself, Slim. Well, that, that was different. What was so different about it? Well, I paid for it. I spent 19 years put away, and I... You don't think it was me killed Edda? Well, I didn't say you killed her, but you could have. Well, I didn't. What did I be killing my own sis for? I haven't any idea. This is a fine thing. I come down here to help you, and I, I get accused of murder. Just because I've been in a little trouble once or twice, you, you can't let a man have no peace. Not even when they're fixing to bury his poor sister. Hey, Slim. Huh? Come here. What do you want? How come it was you, out of all the people looking for Edda, that found her body? You seem to know just where it was. Well, she just happened to be where I was looking. If I killed her, you don't think I'd be fool enough to find the body, do you? Slim, I don't know what to think. Well, Don, a few months went by and no new evidence turned up. Then one day Slim Musry left town and went to Little Rock, Arkansas. Shortly after he arrived, Usry walked into a costumer's shop on Commerce Street and asked to look at a wig and mustache outfit he saw in the window. Yes, sir. Finest wig and mustache in Little Rock. There you are. Yeah, not bad. That seemed better. I uh, take it you're going to a party? Oh, I figured on a couple of parties. You got a looking glass here? They look good on. Maybe I'll take them. Right in back here, sir? Oh, yeah. The uh, mustache sticks right on. I can see how it works. Very good. Very good indeed. Nobody'd recognize you. Not with that on. How much? Well, now, let's see. Uh, that'd be, uh, oh, $11.80 with the tax. Okay. Shall I wrap them up for you? Sure, wrap them. You don't think I'm going to wear them now, do you? Attention, all squads. Be on alert for bandit who robbed auto rental agency, Six and Scott, of several hundred dollars in cash. This man, described as tall and slender, apparently wore black mustache and wig as disguise. Caution. This man is armed and dangerous. Oh, come on in, Sergeant. What a morning, Captain. I had that witness look at every picture in the file. No luck. Not with that wig and mustache disguise. Good disguise. You know, I can't remember anyone using a disguise like that on a hold-up in years. This must be an old-timer. Well, the victim thought he was about 40, Captain. It doesn't make him too much of an old-timer. I wonder if he bought that wig and mustache in one of the shops here in Little Rock. Maybe. But they can't tell whether that stuff came from their shop until they see it. And it looks like we'll have to get our man before they can see it. <laughs> Mr. Huh? Well, Joey, sit down, boy, sit down. Thanks, Mr. Hussery. Uh, call me Slim, Joey. People around here know me as Slim. 
Okay. Slim? Thank gravy you growed. How about a beer, Joey? Oh, no, thanks. Later, maybe. Well, I uh, came as soon as I got your letter. Yeah. I, I wrote to you, boy, because I like you. And I want to do something for you. I was sure glad to hear you didn't go to that reformatory. Well, it was like you said. They gave me a talking to and let me go. They haven't caught me since. That's yeah, good boy, Joey. I uh, figured when I got your letter, you uh, needed some help. Uh, not just yet, boy. First, you got to finish your lessons. Lessons? Well, I could do okay now. I've been doing okay. Well, maybe you could, but we got to be sure about it. Now, tonight, I'm going to try my old disguise trick again. You recollect I was telling you once about disguises? Yeah. Yeah, I remember. Well, boy, tonight... I got a nice little old cafe all picked out. It'll be so easy I won't need help from you. I wouldn't need you even if you were ready. So you just stick around my room. What'll you have? This hey. thing up. What? Reach. What's the matter? Everybody quiet. Wait a minute. I'll... Wait for nothing. I'm in a hurry. Where's the dough? I'll get it. I'll get it. Hey. 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 It, it, it was an accident. I don't like accidents. I don't anybody oh. move. I'm gone. Oh. Anybody follow? Get the thing. Get him. Get him. Oh. Oh. How bad is he, Sergeant? Luckily, not so bad. Both flesh wounds, Captain. This is his room. Okay. Let's go in. Hello, Mr. Wallace. How do you feel now? Oh, not... not bad, considering... I'm Captain Crossman. Oh, hello. Mr. Wallace... Do you think you could recognize the man who held up your cafe and shot you? I... I, I don't know. Maybe I could. I, I ought to know that mustache anyway. Mm-hmm. Is this the mustache? Yeah. Yeah, that's it. I'd swear that's it. It was found in an alley near your cafe. The hold-up man was seen running up that alley. That's, that, that's it, all right. Thanks, Mr. Walters. We know where it was bought. Now all we've got to do is find the man who bought it. I'm telling you, Joey, just like I tell all my boys. If you miss doing something one way, no matter how many times it worked, it ain't good no more. Uh, that seems crazy to me. All you got to do is get another mustache. No, boy, police and everybody else on that mustache and wig trick. I got to try something else. Yeah, but you promised I could try the mustache trick. I said no, boy. When I say no, I mean it. Maybe we'll pick up and go someplace else and try it. But not here in Little Rock. Oh, it's not Slim. And we're just getting set here. And I don't know where I'm going to stay or not. They got a big charge against me. I could have killed that man last night. Oh, the guy was shot up a little. Serves him right. Maybe I should have killed him. Sure. So, he'd have been number three. Uh-uh, Joey. Number four. Number four? You heard me. You mean you killed somebody since I saw you last? What if I did? If you want no account. I'm getting back. We've got to change our way of operating. We've got to jump. Yeah. Boy, where are you going? I'm uh, going out for some air. Well, now watch out where you go and what you do. Well, just going out to get you a present. Present, boy? For me? Sure. And uh, one for myself. I'll uh, see you later, Slim. This is Sergeant Woods. We've got men planted at that costume store. Nothing doing yet, Captain. Well, get in there. And at the other stores, too. Okay, Captain, but it's pretty much of a shot in the dark. This fellow would be a chump to come back for another mustache. Maybe. But if he does come back, I want a welcoming party for him. Joey? Yeah, Slam, open up. Where you been, boy? Get in here. I told you I was going out to buy a present. Oh. Is that it there? Uh-huh, that's it. Well, don't stand there, boy. If you're going to give it to me, give it here. <laughs> I got two of them. What is it? Give it here, boy. Ah, uh, not until you promise I can use one. One what? One of these mustache outfits. 
Mustache outfits. Uh huh. Where'd you get it? Hey, let go. Hey, please let me go, will you? Where'd you get it? At the same store you showed me. Hey, please let me hurt me. Please. I ought to kill you, boy. I ought to beat your brains out. No, please. You could have brought the cops here. You know that. There were no cops. I looked around. Huh? Let go. Huh? No cops? I'm positive. I didn't see anybody. Huh. Well, as long as you didn't see no cops, I guess be no cops coming here, huh? Sure. sure. Everything's okay. Yeah. You didn't listen to me, Joey. I kill people who don't pay no attention. Now, Slim, don't do nothing. Come here, you miserable... No, no, Joey! Didn't mean nothing! Didn't mean nothing, eh? Oh, please! Turn it up! Huh? Police officers, you're under arrest. Huh? Me? Please, I didn't do nothing. He was trying to kill me. We'll see about that, son. Come on, both of you. Now watch all your pulling. Come on, you. Okay, kid. Let's go. No, I don't want to go to jail. Come on, boy. It's just another lesson. It should have been the first lesson. It should have been the first. So, Don, that was the end of the teacher of crime. And Usri, who thought he had committed a perfect murder, made the worst mistake of all. He told someone about it. And the boy, Joey, told the police. In the Little Rock jail, William Usri confessed the murder of his sister, Etta. Usry was returned to Mississippi, where he died in the electric chair in the Forest County Jail a few months ago. Well, congratulations, Chief Pitcock, to you and to the men of the Little Rock Police Department who solved this terrible crime. <laughs> Principal roles in tonight's dramatization were played by Bill Smith and Jack Grimes. Don Gardner speaking. Gangbusters is a Phillips H. Lord production. And now, Gangbusters! Gangbusters, presented in cooperation with police and federal law enforcement departments throughout the United States. The only national program that brings you authentic police case histories. to gangbusters and facts that show the operation of our law enforcement officials in their war against the underworld. Gangbusters has asked the Honorable Saul S. Sherrison, Assistant United States Attorney for the Southern District of New York, to narrate tonight's case. The inside facts in the case of the kidnapped paymaster. Mr. Sherrison, before you begin, I think the gangbusters audience would like to know that you brought to the studio a man who played a very important part in tonight's case. That's right, Don Gardner. He's right over there, and we'll hear from him later. Right now, I think we ought to get on with the report. All right, Mr. Sherrison. The main events in this case occurred right here in New York City. Isn't that right? In the section of New York City known as the Bronx. Almost a year ago, Don, on a Saturday afternoon, the stores in the Fordham Road District were crowded with shoppers. At one particular shoe store, a young woman customer was trying to get fitted while her companion sat next to her. The trouble clerk was on his way with still another pair of shoes to show his hard-to-please customer. Just look what he's bringing over this time. For crying out loud, Terry, you're going to buy a pair of shoes, or aren't you? If I see something that's chic, yeah. Uh, here, madam, is a style that's very smart. Pumps, I asked you for. Do these look like pumps? Well, as I told you, madam, pumps have gone out. They're not wearing pumps this year. If the lady wants pumps, get her pumps. Yeah, get me pumps. I'll take one more look. Excuse me, please. I'll be right back. How do you like the nerve of him, huh? You're not exactly the easiest one in the world to please. If I want pumps, Mac, I want pumps. That's the price you've got to pay for keeping me slaving away in that shop. Look, Terry, I don't want to hear no more about it. You stay on the job there until the time is right. And when's the time going to be right? Meanwhile, I'm breaking my back running a drill press at 40 bucks a week. Who needs it? You'll keep running that drill press until I'm set. You need another guy or two. <laughs> Who are you looking for, Dillinger? Shut up. Ain't four months long enough to find somebody? I wish you'd get your shoes and get out of here. Well, let me take my time, Mac. I'm the one that's got to wear them and I... Oh. Well, how do you like that? What? Here comes that Charlie McCarthy of yours. Bud, where? He's coming. He'd find you in Times Square on New Year's Eve. Hiya, Terry. Mac. I said you went shopping. Did you come to carry the bundles? What do you want, Bud? I had to see you, boss. I'm in a little jam. A cop or a dame? Lay off, will you, Terry? What kind of a jam? Where's that monkey with the pumps? I need about 300 bucks quick. 300 bucks? Well, 280 to be exact. Uh, must be a dame. You're crying out loud, why? I owe it to a guy. 
Stall him. You can give him to him after we pull off the big deal. Heck, I gotta pay him off tonight. If I don't pay him, I'll get my head beat in. Who's got this dough coming anyway? Johnny J. Johnny J? Yeah. Don't you have no more sense than to borrow dough from a rotten loan shark? I needed it. The horses out at Belmont were hungry. So what? How much did you borrow? Two bills. What's the 80 for? That's interest. Interest? Only 5% a week. Hey, you idiot. Where do you have to meet that cigar-smoking chiseler? Oh, at some bar. Tonight. Okay, he'll be met by the two of us. Where's that guy with my pumps? You don't need any shoes. Let's get out of here. Hey, wait a Come minute. Come on, let's get out of this joint before I run you out in your bare feet. Okay, okay, but why get sore at me? I didn't borrow no dough from Johnny J. Let's go, I said. Let's go. I'm coming. Don't rush me. up at the bar. Told you this booth. Sit down. Got a match? Yeah, someplace. Yeah. Thanks. Well, give my dough, I'll buy you a drink. Look, Johnny, I haven't got it. That's what I want. You want to get paid, you rotten welcher. Wait a minute, Johnny. Wait, nothing. Told you what had happened. Ever see a guy get his face burnt with a lit cigar? He'll get you dough. I bet, and tonight, there's a guy here. Has he got the dough? Yeah. He's got it. Oh, I just say so. Let's go get him. We don't have to. There he comes. Oh, Johnny. How long's it been? Mr. the guy? That's him. So now, you... Mac. Now you come taking care of the kids' troubles, McIntyre. I look after my boys. Okay, Bud, scram. Hey, wait a minute. If I don't get my dough, I want his hide. Get out of here, Bud. Go on. Yeah, so long. I'll be safe. Hey, wait a minute. Come here. Sit still, Johnny. He only listens to me. You got a lot of nerve, Mac. One more thing, Johnny. You can stay, but that cigar's got to go. Oh, yeah? Give me a match. I said put the cigar away or I'll shove it down your throat. Well, as long as you ain't got no match. How much did the kid take from you? Comes to 280. I didn't ask what it comes to. What did he take? Took 200. But I'm entitled to my interest. Here's your 200. And now look, Mac, I'm in business. I got it. You've got to not. You don't want the 200? Give it back. 40. It's all there, Johnny. Put it in your pocket. Yeah, I guess it is. All you have to drink? Nothing. I'll see you again sometime. Hey, Mac. What? Don't get the wrong idea about me. I'm still as tough as I used to be. Be as tough as you like? I'm a three-time loser, Mac. Once more, they put me away for good. I don't want that. But remember, I can only be pushed so far. Johnny, have you got any idea why I laid out two bills to get this bud out of soak? Didn't think it was out of the goodness of your heart. He's got a trick, Johnny. He can take the door lock right off a car without leaving a scratch. So, what do you want me to give him, a medal? We take it to a guy, and an hour later, we got a key that fits the ignition and the door. Sweet. Awful sweet. But it takes too many cars to build up a nice score. I want it quicker. And I'm going to get it quicker. Huh? Johnny, I got a deal in the works that I'll have to have a bushel basket to carry away the dough. Yeah, that thought a book at me this time, Mac. Told you I was a three-time loser. I'm not interested in anything. Except staying out in the street. This will be as soft as frozen custard. Worth it? Can you count up to a hundred thousand? I tried hard enough. Wanna hear about it? Can't put me back in for listening. This is a big foundry over in Jersey. I planted my girl in there. The payroll runs fifty to a hundred grand every week. They pay off in cash. Payroll's got guts, Mac. We gotta add more guts, Dick. Look, I've had my girl in that shop for four months. I know that place inside and out. Thursday nights, the payroll lays in the safe with nobody around but an old creepy watchman. What about the safe? I don't think that'd be so creepy. That's where the gimmick comes in. The paymaster lives right here in the Bronx. We grab him at his house, take him back to Jersey. He opens up the safe. That's all there is to it. It's gonna take a lot of doing. For a lot of dough, I can stand a lot of doing. Okay, Mac, figure me in it. Didn't you uh, ask me for a match before? Yeah, yeah, I did. Yeah. Go ahead. Light up that big black cigar. I love him. Thanks. Hey, waiter. Waiter. Another round of drinks here. Make it snappy. 
So, Don, <clears throat> the criminal Na David McIntyre had completed his organization, which he intended to use in robbing the payroll. He had everything worked out nicely, except a few details, like a set of stolen tires and an unexpected doorbell. It was such clues as these that set the Federal Bureau of Investigation on the right trail. Then, in the meantime, the Federal Bureau of Investigation was looking into the interstate car thefts in which McIntyre and young Bud Aldridge were previously involved. These cars were being stolen in Bronx and Westchester counties, New York, then taken to Connecticut and New Jersey, where the accessories were stripped and sold. Special agents Haynes and Martin were at the New York field office discussing the case. Well, Haynes, looks like those car thieves are going to be harder to catch than ever now. They just quit. At least while they were operating, we had a chance to get them with the goods. Uh, I don't know. I don't think they have pulled out of it permanently, Martin. Maybe they got something else to do for a few days. Maybe they took a vacation. They've sure been doing well enough to take a vacation. If you'd think after all this time, we'd at least be able to get a line on them. We'll get our line on them. All we have to do is keep checking those junk shops and second-hand parts places. We'll find where they're selling the stuff. That's all the line we need. Well, I'd better get going. Jersey City? Yeah. I'm going to do a little hunting. Maybe I can turn up something over there. He's going to pull into that parking space down the block, Mac. Okay, double park right here. I'll keep your lights on. Yeah, Mac, sure. <laughs> All set, Johnny. You kidding? Let's go. When you see this car pull out, bud, get right behind us and stay there. I know, I know. Come on. Right with you. On the sidewalk, let's go. Good break, good break. Nobody's out tonight. Let's do it fast and quiet. Never seen a faster guy. Here he comes on your toes, huh? Step here. Uh, pardon me, mister. Yes? Got a match? Yes, I think so. Those cigars of his keep going out. He runs himself and everybody else out of matches. Oh, some cigars are like that. Keep your hands at your sides and don't move. Hey. I'll walk back to your car. Listen, here you... Walk, he said. Okay, okay, but be careful with that gun. Reach in your pocket and give me the keys to your car. All right. Well, what do you want from me? I don't carry much money. Just give me the car keys. Yeah. Get in. Here you are, pal. Open up. Get in, Siegel. Get. Where are you taking me? What do you think? Get in. Oh, please. Go on, get in. In the back, in the back. Okay, in the back. Well, I'm in the back with him, pal. All right. Understand all this. What do you want from me? Explain it to him, pal. You're going back to your office. You're going to open that safe and you're going to hand over tomorrow's payroll. Just like that. But I don't know the combination. Now tell me what you know. But I don't, honest. Kid's right behind us, boss. Good. I told you I don't know the combination. Listen, friend. See this cigar? You know how it gets when it's lit? I don't know how many thousands of degrees hot. Please let me out. Anyway, it gets awful hot. You open that safe or you got the end of this cigar right in your eye. Let me out. I want to get out, please. Shut him up. I can't open the safe. Shut up. I can't. Okay, wise guy. <clears throat> Stay shut. Don't no, knock him out. Not yet. I want him sitting up when we cross the bridge. Okay, okay. <clears throat> no sense getting those cops at the toll gate suspicious. Keep him up and keep him quiet. <sighs> Give him a treatment later if we have to. So, Don... The two criminals and their victim, Mr. Julius Siegel, drove toward the George Washington Toll Bridge, across the Hudson River in Siegel's car, with the third criminal, Bud Aldridge, following in their own car. Within a few minutes, they were on the approaches to the bridge and nearing the toll gate. All right, Siegel, sit up straight. I will, but don't hit me again. Now we're going to stop at that toll gate. We're going to pay the guy, and you're going to keep your mouth shut. You got it? Don't worry, I won't say anything. You better not if you don't want the cigar. Remember. On your toes, pal, a toll gate. Here you are. Fifty cents, right? Fifty cents. Hey, the motor died. I know it. She won't kick over. I will, I will. Ah, 
What's the matter, Master? You got trouble? Yeah, officer. She won't kick over. Maybe you're out of gas. No, there's plenty of gas, officer. It'll be all right. You'll have to get it out of here. Those cars want to get through. I'll give it another try. She's catching feet of gas. Let's go. I heard a figured one like that. Well, there's a trick to starting it sometime. Oh, ask you. <laughs> Take it easy with her. Oh, gotta open that safe. Okay, okay. I'm only playing. The kid's still behind me? Yeah, he's following us. Don't worry. Go ahead. Get that a plan. I want to see what a payroll looks like. Special Agent Haynes. This is Martin. I'm glad I caught you at the office. Yes, I had to finish up something. What's up, Martin? I found a fence over here in Jersey City, Haynes. I think he's the one who's been buying the accessories of those stolen Bronx and Westchester cars. Oh? Uh-huh. What does he have to say? Nothing. That's the point. We found two radios and three sets of tires. He says he bought them in good faith. Says he doesn't know the fellows who sold them. Well, what's the name of this fence? Denver. Joe Denver. He's got a long record for receiving, never a conviction. All right. How about bring him into New York? I'd like to talk to him. Right. We'll be there in an hour. Oh, and say, Haynes, will you call up my wife? Tell her I won't be home tonight. But I'm telling you, I don't know the combination. Did you hear him, boss? He says he don't know the combination. I heard him. We know different. We know you open that safe every morning and close it every night. That's not true, honest. It, is. it ain't true, huh? Hey, boss, give me a match. Why don't you carry your own matches? I'm driving. Catch Thanks. Make it snappy. The plant's in the next block. What are you going to do? Hey, I'm going to light my cigar, that's all. Just light my cigar. <coughs> Good cigar, ain't it? I wouldn't know. <coughs> Told you how hot they get. Now you going to open that safe? Uh, 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 you wouldn't like it in the eye, would you? <laughs> okay. I'll open the safe. Now you're acting smart. What do you care? It's not your dough, I <laughs> okay? Okay, hold on, we're turning in. There's a kid right behind us. Good. Now sit up, Siegel. Feel like we tell you, you won't get hurt. Bad. All right, I'll do anything. Come on, let's go. Okay, Siegel, move. Go on, get out. All right, I'm going. There's the kid. All right, Siegel. Walk right up to the office door, just like it worked here. Which he does, which he does. Get going. Yeah, but you were gone as on the bridge. Shut up and do your job. All right, I'm a bit excited. Here's your keys, Siegel. You open up the front door. But, but what? Move. Come on, move. You're going to open up that front door of the office and walk right to the safe, understand? But if I open the door, the burglar alarm will ring. Is this another store like the combination? No, I'm telling the truth. The burglar alarm will ring. You're lying, Siegel. There's no alarm on that door, I know. Listen, do you think we ought to take the chance? There's no alarm on that door. He just wants to wise up the watchman. Let me tell you something, Siegel. I know this place inside and out. I know how we'll handle that watchman once we're inside. Now open up the door. But look. It's a guy. It's a guy. Okay. Quick now. Holy, the giant spark. He was right. Get him in the car, fast. Come on, get to the car. Get to the car. All right, all right, of course. You're going to let me out here? Are you, please? Yes, Siegel, we're going to let you out. See what he's got on him. You want to get something out of this job? I'll still there, you. All right, I don't have much. Is his wallet. What's in it? Five, six, six bucks. Yeah. <laughs> All this trouble for six bucks. <laughs> six bucks. Okay, he's out. Uh, take your gun and shoot him once through the head. Shoot him? I was looking for the chair. How can they tag us for it if he's dead? I'll tell you how. There's some people with big mouths, that's how. Huh? Who are you talking about? Not you. Who can tell about the kid or even the dame? Yeah, who can tell? All right, just work them over good. I want a head start in the cops. I'll work them over good. Don't worry. Ever see a guy get pistol whipped? Gun's good for more than one thing. There you run. 
Well, like a throw. <laughs> Now, I just sent Joe Denver back to the detention cell, Haynes. We'll file charges in the morning, huh? First thing. You know, Martin, I've never seen it fail. One of these guys think they got something on them, they'll sing their heads off looking for a break. Uh, what a business. Well, it's not such a bad business. Joe Denver sings, we clear up a string of auto thefts. Uh, not so fast. We still got to pick up McIntyre and this young sidekick of his. Well, the information says they're probably still living at that address in the Bronx and running with this Johnny J. They oughtn't to be so hard to trace from there. Uh, we'll see about that. Uh, oh, excuse me. Sure. Hello, Special Agent Haynes. Uh, Haynes, this Crawford over at the Richfield, New Jersey Police. Oh, yes, Crawford. How are you? We've got the victim of a robbery up here. Oh? Uh-huh. They held him up in front of his home in the Bronx and brought him over here to Jersey to open up the safe. That's kidnapping. Yeah, they carried him over the state line. That makes it your beef, doesn't it? It sure does. The Lindbergh law. What have you got to go on, Crawford? Well, the victim, um, Siegel, got the license number of their car, but that's not going to be much help. It was stolen last week in Westchester County. Westchester, well. Tie in with anything? It could. We're working on a Westchester case right now. Stolen cars. Uh, where is this victim? He's still here at our station. Doctor says he can go home after he rests up a bit. Well, keep him there a while. We'll be right over. Okay, I'll be looking for you. So long. Hmm. What is it, Haynes? Come on, Martin. We're going over to Jersey. I'll tell you all about it in the way. I'm ready. Oh, uh, you don't happen to have a picture of McIntyre on you, do you? Yes, I do. Good. Let's go. Six lousy bucks. I spent four months slaving at that drill press for six rotten bucks. I'm sick of hearing about it, Terry. If you found out about that burglar alarm, everything would have been fine. So just shut that big yap of yours. What am I supposed to know about burglar alarms? And watch out what you're calling a big yap. Dad. Oh, Bud. No. Oh, kid brains himself. Come on in, Bud. Better pick up them cars and have a bit of moving, Mac. It's a long drive. I see the small time stuff's good enough for you now. The ass mate was always good enough. You're looking for a crack in the head, Terry. Yeah, from who? Let's go, Bud. Sure, I'll be ready an hour. If you think I'm going back to work on that drill press, you've got another thing coming. Who's asking you to go back? Do what you like. Six bucks. Six lousy bucks. Come here, Terry. Why? Come here, I said. I want to kiss you goodbye. No, stop it. I'll get your dust pack and get out of here. Come on, buddy. Cheer up, will you, Mac? Ah, let me along, will you? All right, so we got a bad break. This didn't work out right. Now we know we should stick to this hot car, right? Listen, bud, I'll tell you what to stick to. Just watch where you're driving. You got a red light. I see it, I see it. We got a good thing. There's a million dames like Terry. A million. For crying in a sewer. Shut up. All right, I just... Look at that car. That crazy driver's gonna clip us. That driver's the kind of Hey, Mac. What? Maybe it's cops. Cops? What cops? Well, right, let's give a piece of our mind. All right, if you say so. Hey, what's the matter? Don't you guys know how to drive? All right, get him up, you two. Huh? FBI. Not me, you know it. You better just keep your hands up. What's the idea? We ain't done nothing. We've got a warrant charging you with kidnapping. Kidnapping? Yes, you should always stop to think at a state line. Come on. Your friend Johnny Jay's been keeping a cell warm for you. He wants company. Okay, okay, I'm going out to push. That done was how the arrest was made. David McIntyre and Johnny Jay were sentenced to 20 years each, and Bud Aldridge was given six years. They are now serving their terms at various federal penitentiaries for abducting Mr. Julius Siegel and carrying him across a state line. Well, Mr. Siegel certainly had a rough time of it. You know, Don... That for every crime, there must be a victim as well as a criminal. And I brought Mr. Siegel to the studio tonight. Well, so I see, Mr. Sharrison. He had an experience that any one of us may be called on to face any day. Well, we're glad to have you on, gangbusters, Mr. Siegel. I'm glad to be here, Don. But I must say that in all my years of listening to gangbusters, I never dreamed that one day I'd be a part of your program. And a very important part, too. I suppose that all of us think of crimes like kidnapping in terms of someone else. It must have been some sensation when you realized that this time you were the victim. Well, Don, from the first I knew those boys meant business. But it wasn't until they were ready to leave me on, to leave me later on, that I started saying my final prayers. Well, just what happened? Well, when they got ready to go, one yelled to the other, kill him and dump him. But then he came back to me and said, we decided not to kill you, we're going to knock you out. That's when they really gave you a going over? That's right, Don. But to tell you the truth, the beating wasn't nearly as bad as the mental torture. 
At first, I thought it was just another sticker. But when my face hit the floor of the car, well, it seemed as though a million things flashed through my mind. But just what kind of things do you mean? Well, maybe this, these thugs had gotten to my wife and children. Also, even if they hadn't, I thought I'd never live to see them again. And then there was that one voice that kept yelling, if he opens his mouth, kill him. I can still hear it to this day. Well, that certainly must have been a grueling experience. Believe me, Don, it was. All I can say is, it's great to be alive. Well, thank you, Mr. Julius Siegel, and you, Mr. Saul S. Sharrison, for coming here tonight and being our guests on Gangbusters. <laughs> Leading roles were played by Ken Lynch and Joe Julian. Don Gardner speaking. Gangbusters is a Phillips H. Lord production. And now in cooperation with police and federal law enforcement departments throughout the United States, the only national program that brings you authentic police case history. Gangbusters. of the notorious gang leader, Bugs Moran, who returned from retirement to kindle old flames, but who learned that not all horse players die broke. Gangbusters has again asked the Honorable Matthias H. Heck, prosecuting attorney, Dayton, Ohio, to narrate by proxy tonight's case. The inside facts in the case of the notorious Bugs Moran. Mr. Heck... Many of our listeners know how the Chicago gangster George Bugs Moran became one of the country's most powerful and feared racketeers until he was forced to flee Chicago just ahead of Al Capone's machine gun bullets. Yes, Don, and it was many years later before he could summon the courage to return to Chicago. Although Capone's organization had long since been broken up and the notorious gang leader sentenced to Alcatraz. On one occasion, Moran left his Minnesota hunting lodge and sauntered up and down North Clark Street, where he was formerly such a power. One rainy night, he ventured into a cheap tavern and ordered a drink. Straight bourbon, friend. Feed the bottle here. Yeah. You been here long? Too long, friend. Well... Just looking at you. Yeah, much too long. I remember when this joint was a speakeasy. And my memory's not that good, friend. Now you understand there's a game in the back room. You understand too much, friend. Let me tell you something, friend. I used to own this joint. Yeah? Yeah. And 40 more like it. Give me back that bottle. You had enough. Leave it later. My name is Moran. George Moran. Bugs Moran. Right. Uh, Nobody ever calls me that. Let go of that shirt, friend. Bugs, I'll show let you. Let go or you'll know the reason. Uh, go on, get out of here. Wait a minute. Get out, friend, before you're a has-been with a cracked skull instead of just a has-been. Look here, smart guy. Hit the road, you bum. Go on, get out. Yeah, your whiskey's rot gut anyway. So long, Bugs. Oh. Take it easy, Winnie. It's just a shower. Yeah? Well, I paid 30 bucks for this hat. Oh, nice. Let's we'll stick in the doorway here until the cab comes along. Just relax. Relax? <laughs> Taxi. Taxi. Ah, oh, the monkey. Hey, any room in there? Help yourself. The doorway don't belong to us. Thanks. Taxi. Yeah, they're all loaded. Some rain, huh? Yeah. Dutch. One. Give me a cigarette. I'm all out, Winnie. Hey, Taxi. Thanks, Here's a cigarette. Hmm? Oh, much obliged. Mike? Yeah. Thanks. Taxi! Wait a minute. Huh? Aren't you George Moran? Oh, you know me, huh? Well, don't you remember me? Winnie. Winnie York. I was hat check girl at the polka dot club. Winnie? Yeah. Oh, sure, sure. I remember Winnie. Sure, yeah. Well, I did put on a little weight since. Dutch. Fine. Taxi! Dutch. Fine. Yeah. Dutch, you know who this is? George Moran. More. Well, what do you know? 
I used to work for you. Dutch Bauer. Yeah, I'm glad to see you again. When I was just a kid, I don't think you ever even saw me. I used to peddle your booze out in Waukegan. Well, what do you know? George Moran. I heard you're retired, uh, country gentleman. That's what they call me. That's for me. My country gentleman stuff. Hey, Dutch, why don't we take George along to the party? Well, I don't know. We were only invited ourselves. No, don't bother about me. Oh, they'd be glad to have him. What do you say, George? He's probably got something else to do. What are you bothering the guy? Well, I haven't got a thing to do. Well, then come along with us. We'll have a great time. Hurry up, Dutch. Get a cab. Uh, Taxi. Taxi. There's one. Come on, George. Let's run for it. Will you, Winnie? What does Bugs Moran mean today? Nothing. He might just as well have been dead for all the weight he carries. But he's got no less brains than he had 20 years ago. Besides Dutch, maybe he's still bigger than you think. I don't know why I listen to you. What do I need him for? The whole thing's set. We're ready to pull the deal. In he walks. Sometimes, Winnie, you give me a pain. Well, he's in. You asked him in. Sure I asked him and You wouldn't leave me alone until I did. Bugs Moran. <laughs> This was running hooch or rough stuff or something like that. Then maybe he'd be okay. This is a slick deal. It takes a touch. <laughs> you and your touch. Things have changed, Winnie. Bugs Moran don't Take mean it. Take it easy on that bug stuff. He don't like it. And to me, George Moran still means plenty. Ah, uh, what difference does it make what he likes? That's him. Answer it then. Bugs Moran, huh? All right, I'm coming. Hello, Winnie. Come in, George. It was a nice party last night. Thanks for taking me. Oh, they were glad to have you. So was I. Hello, Moran. Glad to see you again, Dutch. Sit down, Moran. Sit down. Thanks. Well, uh, I'll fix some drinks. Oh, that's a good idea, honey. What do you have, George? Oh, whatever you get. Uh, you take bourbon, if I remember. That's right. Straight? Yeah, yeah. I didn't think you'd be interested in the deal, Moran. The word is you're plenty well healed. Always have been. Honey's like water, Dutch. It runs out. You gotta keep filling the tank. Yeah. Uh, look, Moran. What? This is a smooth operation. No rough stuff. I don't believe in rough stuff unless it's needed. Hey, come on, give me a rundown, give me. Well, I got me a good couple of boys. One's got its circulating paper, one is engraver. Wait a minute. Why? This deal isn't counterfeit. Well, not money. What the? Something just as easy to shove and a lot easier to duplicate. American Express money orders. Uh-huh. They got a set of plates that's a dandy. I figure if we work it right, we can wholesale about a hundred grand in this stuff. Not less than a hundred grand. You got a sample? Sure. There are lots of samples. Mind if I take a look? No. Help yourself, yeah. Perfect job. Mm. What do you think of it? It stinks. Are you kidding? It's a rotten job. I can tell it's way off without even a legit paper to compare. Look, Moran, we worked a long time on this You thing. didn't work long enough. You'll never make it. Now, wait a minute. Get a hold of that engraver. I want to talk to him. The engraver's finished. We're through with I him. I said get a hold of him. If you don't like the stuff, pick up your hat and walk out the door. We'll get along without any bugs, Moran. Bugs? <laughs> they let go. <sighs> now, let me tell you one thing, Dutch. You invited me in this deal, and now that I'm in, it's going to be run right. You understand? Okay. Okay, take it easy. Refreshments, boys. You're just in time, eh? In time for what, George? Dutch and I came to an understanding. We can all drink to luck. Well, that's wonderful. It's great. Yeah, great. Help yourselves, boys. Bring it on, Dutch. Then go get hold of that engraver. Nah. What's the other one's name? Fisher. But look, Moran... I want to talk to him, too, with the engraver first. Go ahead. Don't start pushing me around, Moran. The days when you push guys around are over. Yeah? And I'd like to see those days come back. And right now is as good a time as any to bring them back. Well? I think I know where to locate the engraver. And Fisher. See if I can raise him. You know, George, I don't like to give you advice, but... But what? Well, 
Dutch wasn't too sold on taking in in the first place. It was me that sold him. Let me tell you something. For a lot of years now, I've been sitting back taking a lot of guff from guys who think they know it all. Every time they open their mouths, you can see all they got is mouth with no brains on the side. Okay, but Dutch said... Ah, uh, who cares for Dutch? I'll tell you who, George. Who? Oh. Nobody, George. Nobody at all. So, Don, the deposed Chicago gangster Bugs Moran was on his way toward making a comeback in the underworld. But he was to learn that the authorities of the law had changed their methods of operating as much as he intended to change his. Now, back to gangbusters. Now, you were telling us, Mr. Heck, how Bugs Moran, the deposed Chicago gangster, had been taken into a syndicate which intended to circulate bogus American Express money orders and had gradually assumed leadership of the conspiracy. That's right, Don. And Moran sent Dutch Bauer to bring still another member of the gang, Fisher, to a meeting where they would discuss Moran's new plans for distributing the fake money orders. Dutch finally located the portly Fisher in a suburban horse room. And 280. Time of the race, 123 flat. At New York in the third, they're off and running. Hello, Fisher. Oh, hiya, Dutch. Grab a chair. Thanks. What's on your mind, Dutch? I need you for a meeting right away. What kind of meeting? New York well, the I... Quarter. I got a bundle in on this Count one. Count Slurley, Uncle John Baisu, and Crack Dice is third. Where's that beetle of mine? He's supposed to be a front runner. Forget about the horses for a minute, will you? Bugs Moran is coming to the bunch. Yes, yeah, so what? Bugs Moran... Where did he spring from? That's what I'd like to know. He's in and he's... Hold it, Dutch. Counselor, still in front by a length. Uncle John, second by a half. And third is now just in time. Just in time. Don't I even get a call out of this race? Local boy. How I ever got touted on local boy, I'll never know. Well, you'll listen to me, Fisher. Oh, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Bugs me. I was telling you, he's practically taken over. He's in there running the show. No kidding. I give the guy a break. What kind of gratitude does he show? It's taking over. Well, maybe it's a good thing, Dutch. What do you mean it's a good thing? Don't you think I can run the show? Maybe you can, but Bugs Moran knows his way around. Now, listen here, for so you'll be... New York. Come on, Come on local first, boy, where are you? Bailing. Hitch is now second by two. Just in time and crack dice, head and head for third. Where's that local boy? Moran's gonna change the distribution game. He's what? Moran's gonna switch everything upside down. He can't do that. It's worked out to a T. You ought to remember when Bugs Moran takes over, he takes over. Distribution is okay. It's okay. It's third at New York. Ah. The winner was number four, local boy. Hey, local boy. And crack dice third. Oh, how do you like that? The horse don't get a call and he win it. He don't get a call. Be at my place tonight, 10 o'clock. Moran will go over the whole thing with you. Yeah, I'll be there. How, how do you like that local boy, huh? You don't get a call and you win it. I'll see you tonight. So long. Yeah, yeah. The race host in the first at King London, now official. The winner, Mr. King, paid seven twenty, three eighty, and three dollars. Uh, telephones, doorbells always. Hello. Fisher? Yeah, this is Fisher. Can you talk? Oh, it's you, Lieutenant. Yeah, I can talk. There's nobody here. Good. I just now got your message. What's up? Plenty, Lieutenant. I think we're after much bigger game than we figured. Huh? Dutch Bauer came around this afternoon. It's going to be a meeting tonight. What time? Ten o'clock, Dutch's place. But, Lieutenant, that's not the important thing. You know who came into the deal? Who? Bugs Moran. Bugs Moran? Yeah. Dutch told me this afternoon. Not only is Bugs in, he's starting to run the show. Well, that puts a new light on things. Now, Dutch tells me Moran is switching the whole gimmick around. He wants to make a million-dollar proposition out of it. That's what the meeting's about tonight. Okay, Fisher. Well, watch your step. Moran's a slick operator. If he ever gets a line on you, you're as good as in the lake. And that's the way it works. We get 50%, the passage 50%. 500 grand, and that ain't a bet. Hey, Fisher. Are you taking this all in, or are you dreaming? I heard every word, Moran. He's thinking you should have had a couple of yards on that horse today instead of 50. Hey, you think that would have been bad, I don't huh? like guys sitting around pipe dreaming while I'm laying out the gimmick. I told you, Moran, I took in every word. All right. 
Give me a rundown, then. Let's get the details. I've been batting them through my head two days. Well, like you said, instead of a hundred grand in money orders, we shove a half million. Yeah. Uh-huh. You said you got plenty of contacts, so we get together a syndicate. Uh-huh. Guys in every city, all over the country. Every money order gets cashed on the same day. One day, and then we quit. Yeah, that's about it. Any questions, Nitch? Only when's the day? Soon. Well, how soon? Track opens in Miami the 23rd. I got plans. Maybe your plans will have to wait. I'm not rushing things so you can watch those cockroaches run around a circle. Okay, don't tear a muscle. I was only hoping. This is going to be the sweetest deal ever. We take our time and we get everything lined up just so. Well, how about a little refreshments? I'll call Winnie and Will. Hey, not just yet, Dutch. No, what's the matter? Something just came to my mind. Yeah? Yeah. Fisher, I've been trying to place you ever since you walked in that door. I uh, told you this is the first time I laid eyes on you, Moran. He comes from East St. Louis. At least that's what he said. I thought I saw you before. And now I know where. Well, maybe. I'm no babysitter. I get around. If it's what I'm thinking of, Fisher, you'll get around plenty. And you're back. What's the trouble, Moran? If you got something on your mind, Moran, get it off. Sure. I'll get it off. Answer me yes or no, Fisher. Back in 29, you tailed me for days. Don't be nuts, Moran. You never could get me where you wanted me. Isn't that right? Now, look, Moran. You were with Al Capone, weren't you? Answer me. You are one of Capone's boys. Well? What if I was? I was only a punk kid doing a job. I didn't have nothing against you. I knew I could smell you. I'll take it easy, Moran. Sure. He had a job. There wasn't anything personal. Okay. Okay, I guess there wasn't. Anyway, I lived through it. Didn't we all? Let's have those drinks, Dutch. A change of jockeys. Al Haynes is now riding Roadmaster instead of M. Kramer. And that's the way it stands, Lieutenant. Uh-huh. It's not good, Fisher. Um, do you think you can talk Moran into a test a day or so before the big day? A test? Sure, to see how the stuff is accepted. And we can make our pinch on that test without risking too wide a distribution. I don't know. Maybe he'll go for it. I'll try. Okay. But be careful how you handle it. Don't worry, I will. Uh-oh. What's the matter? Dutch power, and he's seen us. I'll get out of no, here. No, no, sit still. You don't be more suspicious. He's coming over. In the six at New York, number four, your welcome has been scratched. Hello. Yes, sir. Mind if I sit down? Help yourself, Dutch. Thanks. This is Lieutenant Thacker, Dutch power. We see. Hi. Army, Navy, or Fire Department? State attorney's office. Uh-huh. Well, you weren't much help, Fisher, but thanks. Don't mention it. Nice to meet you. What does a cop want with you? He's looking for somebody? You didn't know where the guy was. The one he was looking for. Well, there's one way to handle cops. Let them think you're helping them Dutch, but don't. You're a lucky guy, Fisher. Why? You see, I knew it was law. If you'd have told me it was something else, that's all, brother. I've got nothing to hide. What's up, Dutch? Moran wants to see you. Not another me. Ten o'clock tonight. We're all set to go. Me. It's me. I'll see you there. I are off and running in the fourth. That's New Orleans. That's 420. That's Keeneland in the third race. If a guy's once got it, George, he's always got it. Well, a little tough, baby. I never thought I'd make it back to the top. And this is going to be the send-off. There ought to be nearly 200 grand in it for me. Yeah, I'd be disappointed if there wasn't. The way Dutch was running, it was for buttons. Mm, Dutch is a buttons kind of guy when he... He's no good for you. Who is? Who do you think? Can I... Can I get you another drink? Not now, Winnie. We've got... Winnie, I... Oh. Hello, Dutch. Fisher, how's it going? Not a winner all day. I didn't expect to find you here, Moran. 
I thought that meeting last night covered everything. I didn't come here to see you. No? I came to see Winnie. George, Shut I... up. Have you got business with Winnie now? Yeah, Dutch. Plenty of business. Been unfinished a long time. They got a name for a guy like you, Moran. Yeah, I guess they have. Look, maybe I'll take a walk. Oh, stick around. You don't expect me to stand still while you take over everything, Moran, do you? You'll stand as still as I say. Boys, there's no sense getting worked up over this. Uh, who wants her anyway? Take her. I intend to, Dutch. I think I'll go out for a walk. Business before pleasure, boys. See you later. Well, Dutch, you got anything else to say? About what? About nothing. Eh, uh, Fisher, you might like to know, I thought over that idea of yours about the test passing. Yeah? You haven't got a bad idea there, Fisher. Not bad at all. Well, I figured we could make this test passing on a Saturday. Mm. We see how it goes. Now, if everything's okay, the big day will be Monday before any of the Saturday stuff has a chance to clear any banks. Yeah. What do you think, Dutch? Anything's okay, Moran, so long as you say so. Good. And I think we'll try it out in Pittsburgh. How's next Saturday? Great. I'm glad to hear it. Then I can shove off for Miami. All right. We leave for Pittsburgh Thursday. Meantime, Dutch, you get in touch with the boys all over. They're going to do the passing. Okay. You get in touch with them and tell them that right after we make the test, we send each of them a wire. Tell them when they get it, be ready to unload Monday. So that's the way it was, Lieutenant. The big day is set for next Monday. The test will be this Saturday. Good work, Fisher. But I wouldn't have given a nickel for your chances of getting the idea across. Well, Moran went for it, hook, line, and sinker. Hmm. Look, Lieutenant, I'll have to stick pretty close to Moran. Everything will be taken care of for Pittsburgh, huh? Don't worry, it'll be all set. I'll see you there. Yeah, so long and good luck. Good luck yourself. You need it more than I do. Turn it off, you all, sir? Is that enough? How about you, pal? You want anything? No, not here. Oh, well, let's see. Two shirts at seven fifty, two neckties, twenty three eighty with the tax. Yeah, look, I got an express money order. It's all in door. Huh? Hundred dollars. Yeah, take it out of there. I'll have to get the section managers. Okay, sir. Oh, go get it. Don't stand around. Yes, sir. Be right back. I like that guy, Fisher. I'm not worried about the guy. I just hope that paper gets by. It means a lot to me. What do you think it means to me? It'll get by. I hope Dutch is making out okay. If we pass that paper here, it'll be okay anyways. We send out the wires tonight. Uh-oh, here comes the crook. Yeah. I have your change for you, sir. Good. Glad to add. Could you show me some of those shirts? Be with you in a second, sir, as soon as I finish with this customer. Excuse me. Take your time. 2380, 24, 25, 30, 40, 50, 70, 90, 100. Much obliged. Your package will be ready in a minute. Okay. Don't move, Moran. Watch it. Get him up. Come on, let's get out of here, Fisher. You're not going any place, Moran. Fisher, you watch it. No, you don't. Stand back. Everybody, stand, stand back, back, please. Stand back. Well, Come Lieutenant, on. that takes care of Bugs Moran. It certainly does, Mr. Fisher. Yeah. Let's get him in. Sure. Stand back, folks. It's all over. Stand There's back. nothing to see. It's all over. It's all over. So, Don, the fabulous Bugs Moran was caught in the act of passing Ford's money orders. He was tried and sentenced to a term in prison. But this wasn't the end of his criminal activities, Mr. Heck. No, it certainly wasn't. Another climactic episode, which closed just a few months ago, was still to come. And you'll return to Gangbusters next week to tell us about it? I'll be here. Well, thank you, Mr. Heck, for the inside facts you've given us tonight. And now, in cooperation with police and federal law enforcement departments throughout the United States, the only national program that brings you authentic police case history... Gangbusters! Tonight, the case of the devil and the syndicate, and how two desperate gangs of criminals fought a bloody battle that lasted years for the largest prize in the annals of crime. Gangbusters is asked the Honorable Matthias H. Heck... Prosecuting attorney, Dayton, Ohio, to narrate by proxy tonight's case. The inside facts in the case of the devil and the syndicate. Mr. Heck, 
I know that the gangbusters audience is going to hear some familiar names in tonight's case. They certainly are, Don Gardner. Names that were in every newspaper every day for years. But right now, they're just names. The major characters are all dead. Or in prison with sentences they'll never live to serve. Well, supposing you begin, Mr. Heck. All right, Don. The closing events in the case occurred just a few months ago. But to understand these men, we should go back more than two dozen years. One bright spring morning in Chicago, a young man crossed North State Street in front of the Holy Name Cathedral. As he approached the other side, he saw the florist shop for which he was looking. He stopped for a moment to glance at a wedding wreath in the window. Then he walked toward the door. Well, here goes. Yes, sir? Can I help you? Yeah. First, you can give me one of them carnations. Yes, sir. They're very pretty. One of these? No, one of the red ones. I like red. Yes, sir. Shall I paint it in your lapel? Yeah, why not? What do you do after you get through here? I go to night school to learn jujitsu. No kidding. There you are. How much? 25 cents. Cheap enough. Catch. Thank you. Call again. Come on and back and tell your boss I want to see him. My boss? O'Banion. Tell him George is here. Do you have an appointment? Who needs an appointment? Who is it, Lillian? Well, Are uh, you yeah. O'Banion? That depends who you are. The name is Moran. George Moran. Lillian, run down the corner and get me the evening papers. Yes, sir. Right away. I'll be right back. Cute trick. She's like the flower business, Moran. A front. So hands off. Okay. That recommendation from Rossi rated you pretty high. We got along. Good as anybody can get along in Joliet. Things have changed since you went in, Moran. So I hear. They got a law now. The 18th Amendment, they call it. They want people to stop drinking. But they made a mistake. Too many people don't like that law. When there's a law people don't like. Somebody's bound to make a fortune out of it. <laughs> we even had bootleggers in Joliet. Come on in back. I want you to meet one of my friends. Yeah, sure. He's one of my vice presidents. You'll be another. The wife. I want you to meet George Moran. Earl White. Pleased to meet you, Bugs. The name ain't Bugs. It's George. Okay, no harm, man. I just heard they called you Bugs. Nobody calls me Bugs. Never. Take it easy, George. We don't go for rough stuff. And we don't go for rough talk unless it's called for. Okay. I said things were changing. We're in business. We're legit, uh, practically. Just tell me what I do and when I start doing it. You'll have plenty to do. We're organizing the whole North Side. Every drop of booze and every mug of beer that's sold on the North Side will be ours. That's all right with me. Uh... But suppose some other guys get different ideas. That's one of the reasons I'm putting you on the payroll, Moran. Don't worry. Nobody will muscle in. Hey, muscle in. That's a good way to put it. Yeah. I'll have to remember that. Not bad. Like this, Moran. There's a bunch over on the west side and the south side doing the same thing we are. So long as they stay there and don't muscle in, nobody will get hurt. And it's working out okay. I've got an agreement with the guy that runs things, Johnny Torrio. Sounds as easy as selling flowers. I don't know. That Torrio may be all right, but he just brought a guy in from Brooklyn, a bad actor. Huh? I know a lot of guys from Brooklyn, who is he? Um, what's his name, boss? Um, Al. Um, Al something or other. Yeah, that's it. Al Capone. So, Don, the Chicago gangs grew stronger as each of them strained to expand beyond the limits of the agreed territories. For three years, no gang leader would make the first move because he could foresee the violence that would follow. Then one day, Bugs Moran had an urgent summons from the operator of a speakeasy on the north side. He walked into the smoke-filled place and saw the operator sitting at the bar. Hello? 
Hello, Patsy. Hello, oh, Moran. Sit down. Yeah. Harry, straight bourbon for Mr. Moran. Okay. Well, that's your trouble. Maybe it's your trouble, Moran. What do you mean? Just put the bottle down, Harry. Go take care of them customers down there. All right. Don't talk in riddles, Patsy. Pour yourself a drink. Thanks. Luck. Good stuff, huh? Come on, Patsy. I didn't come over here to drink your booze. What's the trouble? You just drank it. Now, look. Take a squint at that bottle. Hey, where'd you get that stuff? I bought it. You'll get in trouble, Patsy, making buys from outside. They backed the truck up here, Moran. They unloaded 40 cases. They said, take the stuff or take a dose of lead. I took the stuff. Ain't bad, is it? Who was it? How should I know? Three gorillas with a look in their eye. You pulling a fast one, Patsy? Me? I buy your rot gut and pay you good for peace and quiet. I pay you to keep guys like that off my neck. He'll be off your neck, Patsy. Don't worry about that. Okay. So long. And uh, thanks for the drink. I'll match it. You got too hot a temper, Moran. I said this is business. No rough stuff unless it's called for. Those monkeys won't understand nothing except rough stuff, O'Banion. First it's one joint, then it's another. Then they'll be all over the north side. It's a mistake. Johnny Torrio, don't make mistakes. Where's Weiss, anyway? I told him the meeting was off. It's all settled. Settled? How? I put in a call for Johnny Torrio. He's going to get it straightened out and call me back. Yeah? Well, if you... Maybe that's him. Yeah, and maybe it ain't. Just do your job, Moran. I'll handle this. Hello? O'Banion? Yep. Who is it? Johnny Torrio asked me to call. This is Al Capone. Oh, there's Al. You checked up on that deal? Yeah, and as far as we know, it wasn't our boys that made the sale. Oh? We don't like that kind of business either, O'Banion. We want to put a stop to it as much as you. Well, what are we waiting for? Johnny Torrio said get the details. He said work with O'Banion a deal, Capone. Uh, suppose I send a couple of boys around tonight to see you. Uh, make it tomorrow, Capone, at the flower shop. Yeah, at the flower shop. They'll be there. Lillian. Lillian? Yes, Mr. O'Banion. Oh, Mr. Moran. Yes, sir. I'll... Oh, and Lillian. Yes, sir? Uh, first bring me that bird seed. Kankakee's hungry. Aren't you, Kankakee? Hmm? Here, see? Oh, here come some customers. Yes. I'll wait on them first. They're not customers. Just some gentlemen I'm expecting. So go in back, make that call to Moran. Yes, sir. I'll do it right now. Oh. Come in, boys. Come in. Hello, Banyan. We've been at the phone. Glad to see you. All right. Well, how are we going to straighten out this mess? Capon says it's easy. Then let's get to it. Sure, Banyan. Let's get to it. Hey, what's the idea of the guns? So long, pal. Come on, let's get out of here. Thus done, the two leading gangs of Chicago's racketeers declared war on each other. A gang war that lasted many years. And bloodshed mounted with the months. Now, back to gangbusters. Now, you've told us, Mr. Heck, how gang war flared up in Chicago after the Johnny Torrio Al Capone syndicate sought to invade the North Side and murdered gang leader Diana Banyan. Yes, Don, and the story of the killing was the new sensation of the day. O'Banion's principal lieutenants, Earl Little Jaime Weiss and George Bugs Moran, were on hand at the funeral parlor where O'Banion's body was on exhibition in a $10,000 casket surrounded by tons of gaudy floral pieces. There they planned retaliation, not so much to avenge O'Banion as to salve their own peculiar pride. We gotta go through with it, Weiss. We gotta run Torrio and Capone into the ground. You're wrong, Moran. Nobody can make out if we spend our time killing each other. 
We're in it for dough. That's the way O'Banion wanted it. Yeah. And look where O'Banion is. You don't want to sit around and let Capone and Torrio give you the same kind of going over, do you? Maybe we could get the whole thing settled. Oh, settled. You talk like a maniac. There's only one way it's going to be settled. That's when we get the whole town. I don't know. I was just figuring... Quiet, might... quiet, quiet, yes, only... Mr. Weiss, can I see you a minute? What's the matter, Lillian? Well, another floral piece just arrived, and I... Oh, well, thought... then bring it in. But there isn't room for any more flowers. Besides, this is bigger than anything in here. It's huge. Who sent it? I, I don't know. I didn't open the card. Come on, Moran. Let's have a look. Yeah, sure. Where are these posies? Out in the ante room. This way. They gotta be brought in the line, Weiss. That's the only way. We'll see. We'll see. Right in here. There it is. Well, for crying out loud, who's men all that dog? It's pretty, huh? That's oh, hideous. <laughs> Where's the card? Uh, this must be it. How many men did it take to carry it in? Five? Well, who's it from, Moran? Here. Read it yourself. Here. Rest in peace, Johnny Torrio and El Capone. That dirty rotten. You're right, Moran. They need a lesson. Put me at those wheels. No, no, Boy, no. Yeah, let me. Don't get worse, Who cares how much you went to get the best part? Soon, Don, George Bugs Moran and Earl Little Jaime Weiss sought and got revenge on gangster Johnny Torroy. Thus, the notorious Al Capone came into command. The war between the two factions continued with one or two gangsters losing their lives every week. Finally, little Jaime Weiss got his, and Bugs Moran became undisputed head of the North Side mobsters. But the pyramid of gang murders didn't help, and both sides knew it. So it was arranged one day that Bugs Moran walk alone and unarmed down a long hotel corridor toward a room at the end. As he walked, he looked carefully at each closed door he passed. Then, on reaching the end of the corridor, he stopped and opened the door. Come in, Moran. Sit down. Make yourself at home. Thanks, Capone. Well, are you ready? Yeah, Capone. I am ready. It's about time we figured we weren't doing ourselves good. What are your terms? We split up the city and county. You stay on your side... I stay on mine. Uh, whose side begins where? We go back to the old territories, the ones set up by Johnny Torrio and Diane O'Banion. It's a deal. And the deal covers everything. The booze, the beer, the dogs, the ladies. Everything, Gabon. Okay. We'll shake on it. I can still remember Diane O'Banion went to shake hands. He got led. We shake, so there's no deal. I can take the deal or leave it, Capone. You're acting pretty dumb for a smart cookie, Moran. Guy can afford to be dumb if he's lucky. Well, that's the way you want it, Moran. Put it here, Al. Uh, that's more like it. We'd show them how to run a town. Got no doubt about us running the town, Al. Let's just keep them trying to run each other. Gee, you remember that guy I was telling you about? Guy, guy, what guy? Guy with the ideas. With the ideas? Oh, yeah. I got him uh, back in my office. Well, oh, let's go see him. I think it'll work, Moran. Ought to be good for plenty each month. Uh, what'd you say this guy's name was? Joe. Joe or Jerry. Joe or Jerry. Okay, open up. Hello, Joe. Joe. I want you to know George Moran. Glad to see you. Patsy tells me you got a new grift. Yeah. If you go for it, Moran, do I get a spot? Sure, sure. I get a million spots. Come on, hurry up, though. I got to meet a girl outside. Well, the idea is this. There's lots of little guys in business. Big ones, too. Yes, yes, I know. They got all kinds of stores. So we form all kinds of organizations. All the cleaners in one association, all the laundries in another. Follow me? 
Yeah, go on. So before we start these associations, a cleaner here, a cleaner there is going to have trouble. A brick through his window, a stink bomb maybe. So they join the association to protect their business. And? And they get protection. Without joining the organization, they get no protection. Good stiff dues. Right. Good stiff dues. To us. Well, what do you think of it? It stinks. But it's a cinch. I said it stinks. Go on, get out. George. It'll work. It'll make millions. I said get out. Now hit the ties, you crumb bun. Okay. It's just an idea. It's all. What was the idea, Moran? That guy had something. And he? Sure. Be a cinch to operate. You got the strong arm. Boys, that's all you need. I know it. And try it out first in the cleaning shops. Hey, you told Joe you didn't go for the idea. Sure, why should I cut him into the deal, a stranger? Yeah, why should you? Boy, I can see this thing spreading all over the city. Maybe farther. Maybe to New York. Uh, yeah? What about Capone? Well, what about him? Capone ain't gonna like it. That I'm not like it. There's been peace and quiet too long. I'm sick of it. Come on. Moran? Yeah? Al Capone. How's it going? No complaints, Al. Well, I got a complaint. Have you? Yeah. Uh, that protection racket of yours is a pretty good idea, Moran. Yeah. I like it. But uh, it's covering too much ground. It'll cover more ground, Al. Nothing like it was included in the agreement. Well, that's the way you want it. It is. Okay, Moran. Be seeing you. That dawn was the beginning of another flare-up between Chicago's rival gangs. And the direct result was the most sensational and blood-curdling event to arise out of the long history of Chicago's mobsterism. You were telling us, Mr. Heck, that gang war between the Al Capone and Bugs Moran mobs broke out all over again. That's right, Don. There were many killings on both sides. With the feud at its height, Bugs Moran called a meeting of a dozen of his henchmen at the garage on North Clark Street he sometimes used as headquarters. By a little after ten in the morning, eight of his lieutenants had arrived. So what, Moran? So they're a little bit late. When I tell guys to be here, I mean it. Ah, will you monkeys keep quiet? How can anybody think? Okay, boys, don't get excited. Now just keep it quiet. That'll be along in a minute. What do you say we get some coffee? Ah, coffee, coffee. Come on, come on. You're going to relax. All right, Patsy. I guess I can stand some relaxing, too. Well, you knew what was going to happen. You knew Capone wouldn't sit still. Okay, okay. I heard all about it. I want to hear Let's get out the side door and cut through the alley. It's shorter. Anyways, all right. <laughs> you guys stick here. I'll be right back. Are you going out to buy me a present, boss? Present? Yeah, I'll give you a present. But, boss, it's Valentine's Day. Oh, Valentine's Day, huh? I'll get busy here. You think it's the 4th of July? <laughs> Come on, Patsy. Let's go. You ought to take it easy, Moran. You'll get Capone in the end. Just take me to that car. Sure. Maybe you could get the old agreement working again. I don't want to hear no more about it. Take a look around before we hit the sidewalk. Yeah. No, there's nothing. Hey, what? Cops. Huh? Just pulled up in front of the garage. Get close to the wall. You haven't got enough trouble now, cops. All right, let's go. With machine guns. Come on, come on. Hey, those aren't cops. They're Capone guys. Okay, get inside. Let's do a good job. What do you say, boys? Let's go get them. Oh, stick where you are. We got to warn the guys. There's seven of them left in there. They can take care of themselves. Not against machine guns. Besides, they think the cops. Stick here, I said... It's like a slaughterhouse, boss. Yeah. Come on, let's go after Moran. We'll get a couple of them anyway. Oh. We can show them. Oh, let's get out of but here. But Moran. Come on, let's move fast. Yeah? What is it? He's outside, George. What's his name? Foster. Bill Foster. Bill Foster. All right. 
Bring him in. Yes, George. And Lillian. Yes. Leave the blindfold on. Sure, George. All right. Come on in. Better help me through the door, miss. I'll help you. Right through here. Come in, Foster. You Moran? Go on out, honey. Leave us alone. Sure, George. I'll be right outside. Hey, how about let me take the blindfold off? Not on your life, brother. What paper you with, anyway? The American? Who was it, Moran? Who shot up the garage? Who killed those seven guys? Only Capone's gang kills like that. And you lost a lot of talent. Gonna do anything about it? If I was, I wouldn't tell it to a newspaper. But you're not? I made up my mind to quit Chicago. Leave it all to Capone? I didn't say I was yellow, and don't you print it. Where are you going? Just say I made up my mind to retire. I've been thinking about it a long time, and I just now made up my mind. But don't say I'm quitting because I'm scared of Capone. Because you're not, huh? Between you and me, Foster, I am. I know when I'm cooked. Capone's cooked, too, but he don't know it. It won't be me or anybody like me that gets him. But he'll be got. You remember that. So, Don, George Bugs Moran foresaw the end of gang rule in Chicago. And it was not many months after he fled Capone's vengeance that the notorious gang leader was arrested by United States Treasury agents under the great Elmer L. Irie and subsequently sentenced to a long term on Alcatraz. But what about Bugs Moran, Mr. Heck? Well, Don Moran remained in retirement until just a few months ago. But the time came when he once more thought he could make a killing. This time for a million dollars. Then you'll be back next week to give us another episode in the fantastic criminal life of Jug- George Bugs Moran? I certainly will, Don. Well, thank you, Prosecuting Attorney Matthias H. Heck of Dayton, Ohio. We'll all be looking forward to next week's case. Now, Gangbusters, presented in cooperation with police and federal law enforcement departments throughout the United States. The only national program that brings you authentic police case histories. My name is Ernest Gaither, Jr. I'm here in the Cook County Jail with only 29 hours to live before I go to the electric chair. Listen later to the rest of this amazing statement of a murderer who died in the electric chair only a few hours ago. A statement recorded inside the death cell especially for gangbusters. And now to gangbusters and facts that show the operation of our law enforcement officials in their war against the underworld. Gangbusters is again asked the Honorable Matthias H. Heck, prosecuting attorney, Dayton, Ohio, to narrate by proxy tonight's case. The inside facts in the case of the notorious Bugs Moran. Mr. Heck, we know how George Bugs Moran, who for years was Al Capone's only serious rival in the Chicago underworld, finally was sentenced to a term in prison, the first he had served in 20 years, despite numerous crimes accredited to him. And it was a comparatively short sentence, Don Gardner. Moran was soon out of prison. To all appearances, he was making an effort to go straight. He set himself up as a speculator in oil leases and was operating in the southern Illinois and Indiana boom country. One day about a year ago, Moran and an associate were seated in the rectory of a church at Vandalia, Illinois, waiting to keep an appointment with the pastor. Give me a cigarette, Moran. You don't have to smoke in here. Well, I don't see no signs. You don't see no signs. You don't have to smoke. Just sit there and don't say nothing when he comes in. Who wants to say something? Don't open your yap and everything. Okay, here he is. Now, get up. Get up. Get up, I said. Uh, Hello, Reverend. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, Nice to see you again, Reverend. Yes? I... Oh, this is my associate, uh, Mr. Virgil Summers. How you do, Reverend? Virgil is a name with a heritage. Uh, Everybody calls me Doc. Uh, uh, Well, uh... Sit down. Thanks. Well, Reverend, did you talk over our proposition with the elders? I did, Mr. Moran. And? 
The matter was left undecided until I brought them the answers to a few more questions. Well, anything they want to know, Reverend. The church has got that 40 acres of land out there that has a good chance of having oil under it. Now, if we bring in oil, why, every Sunday, instead of members of the congregation putting into the contribution box, they'll have to take out just so as you can get rid of the money. That's how rich the church will be. I uh, doubt, Mr. Moran, that such an extreme measure would be necessary. Well, I can't for the life of me see what you're hesitating for. Uh, can you, Mr. Summers? Uh, I cannot, Mr. Moran. Well, as Moran. you know, gentlemen, the first consideration is whether under the terms of the late Mr. Baker's will, we can use the property for this purpose. Mr. Baker bequeathed it to us as a cemetery, you know. Now, Reverend, However, I think the you... elders agree that we may be able to obtain a liberal interpretation of Mr. Baker's generous... Now we're getting someplace. Uh, But there is one other consideration, Mr. Moran. Anything, Reverend, anything at all. It has come to our attention that you are also the notorious Bugs Moran of Chicago. My name is George Moran. It never was Bugs Moran. But you are from Chicago. Well, what difference does it make where I come from or what I was? I'm here with a legitimate business proposition and that ought to be enough. I'm afraid, Miss Moran, the elders would prefer to deal with someone longer established in the oil business. Come on, Doc. Let's go. Uh, wait, wait a minute, Moran. Maybe the Reverend wants uh, another kind of business. Come huh? on. Okay, I'm coming. Good day, gentlemen. So long, Reverend. I see you in church. Preachers and widows and banks. And what's the matter with banks, Doc? Yeah, nothing, nothing at all, Moran, if we do business with them in the right way. But this oil lease pitch is a waste of time and a waste of money. Don't tell me what's a waste of money, Doc. As long as we're in the oil lease business, we get a legitimate pursuit. There's nobody can say nothing to us for being around. Okay, but can't you pick a legitimate pursuit we can make dough at instead of throwing it away? Who knows, Doc? Maybe oil will turn up under some of that land we got under lease. Yeah, maybe someday cops will shoot dollar bills out of their guns instead of bullets, but I ain't waiting around to find out. Angie says... Oh, Angie, who cares what Angie says? I care what she says. And you ought to, too. She comes in pretty handy when a job needs a lady's touch. Let me tell you something, Doc. Keep Angie and the rest of your homework out of my hair. If you want to string along with me, we make a buck. Otherwise... Goodbye. Now, wait a minute, boss. I was just talking. Now talk to yourself or Angie. When it comes to business, just listen. Okay, okay. Don't get excited. Stick here. I'm going to put in a long-distance call to Dayton. You well? Yeah, yeah. Now you're talking. I hope he's all set. If he's set, you'll know about it. There's only one thing. Yeah? Tell Al if the deal's got any preachers in it, it's, it's out. I'll be right back. Yes, uh, did you want to see me? Reverend Thomas? That's right. My name's Dixon. I'm a special agent of the Federal Bureau of Investigation. Oh, yes. Uh, sit down. S- sit down. Uh, Mr. Dixon, you said? Dixon, yes. Thanks. Well, Mr. Dixon, I... I suppose you hear from a lot of old cranks like me. No one's a crank, Reverend. No one that has something that might turn into a legitimate lead. Well, as a matter of fact, Mr. Dixon... After thinking the whole thing over and losing no little sleep, I'm sorry that I phoned you. I'm not, Reverend. It comes down to this. Bugs Moran or no Bugs Moran, the man approached me on what was a legitimate enterprise. I had no right to treat him so shabbily. He's probably making every effort to live a better life. And he should be encouraged, especially by a minister of the gospel. This is Bugs Moran you're talking about? Bugs Moran or or any other man. Reverend, we've been following Bugs Moran for weeks, since long before he approached you. Well... His oil lease business may be legitimate, but we think it's only a blind. A, uh, what, Mr. Dixon? A blind. Camouflage for something else. Oh. I suppose you've read about the several bank robberies in southern Illinois and Missouri and Indiana in the last year. Read about them? I preached a sermon on the subject. So, you think Moran is the bank robber? We're watching him, Reverend. Well... We haven't been able to prove it yet, but we think we will. Well, so long. 
long, Doc. I'll see you in Dayton. So long, Angie. Toodaloo, Moran. You want me to walk to the train with you? What's the matter? Don't you think he can find the train himself? You just drive on, Angie. Doc, get this car in shape. Sounds like it hasn't been greased in a year. So long. Fine voyage. Give my best to Al. Huh? Yeah. I'll see you tomorrow. Okay, get moving. Where to? One of your oil wells? Angie, so help me. Someday I'm going to twist your nose around to your ear. Doc. And lay off Moran, will you? We've been doing okay with him. You mean he's been doing okay with us? That has been. Angie. Bugs Moran, who needs him? We got him. That's all there is to it. Now shut up about it. Doc? Yeah? What's the state in case? Watch it. You got a red light okay, there. Okay, I see it. I'm not blind. I ask you a question. What question? What gives in Dayton? What did Al come up with? Ask Moran. Oh, Doc, I swear I'm going to claw okay, you. Okay, go ahead. The light's green. Oh, yeah. We're pulling out for Dayton tonight. You throw your duds in a bag and be ready to go. But, Doc, I don't You want heard to me. To... We're driving to Dayton. I don't want to hear no more about Moran or oil wells or anything. Just drive. Special Agent Haynes. Mr. Haynes, Special Agent Dixon's on long distance from Van Deel, Illinois. Oh, good. Put him on. Yes, sir. Hello, Haynes. What's up, Dixon? Moran bought a ticket to Dayton, and he's on the train now. I sent Greer along to keep him company. Okay. We'll take over on this end when the train gets in. Uh, what's in Dayton? I haven't any idea, but it must be a deal. Oh? It looks like he's coming alone to avoid suspicion. I think Doc Summers and the woman are getting ready to make the drive there. They're having the car serviced. Are you going to stay with them? I'll be right behind them wherever they head. If it's Dayton, I'll see you. Okay, Dixon. We'll be looking for you. And keep your fingers crossed, Haynes. Before this is over, I think we'll have Moran where he'll never be able to squeeze his way out again. So, Don, as the notorious Bugs Moran and his henchmen were about to pull a deal, as they termed it, in Dayton, Ohio, they were unaware that agents of the Federal Bureau of Investigation were maintaining a constant surveillance of the mob, hoping to catch them in the act of committing a crime. Now, back to gangbusters. You were telling us, Mr. Heck, how agents of the Federal Bureau of Investigation suspected the deposed Chicago racketeer Bugs Moran as the leader of a gang of bank robbers. That's right, Don. And Moran had been followed to Dayton, Ohio, in the hope of catching him and his confederates in the act of committing a crime. Later, the criminal Doc Summers and the woman Angie arrived by car from Illinois and rang the bell at the house where Moran was staying. Fine reception. Guess nobody's home. Angie, I've been listening to you beef for 300 miles. Now keep it quiet. Or I give you really something to beef about. Ring the bell again, will you? Uh, yeah. Running all over the country like a bunch of bombs. Angie, of... I swear. Here comes somebody. Okay, then get a smile on your puss. I'll smile when I want to. Hello, Al. Doc, come in, come in. Did you have a good ride? Yeah, considering. I had a good ride, too. That's nice. We're into the parlor, Doc. You want to see you. Uh, yeah? Where in here? Yeah, yeah, this is it. Come on, Angie. I'll show you where you're booked. Well, maybe I got something to say to Moran, too. If you have, you can say it later. Go on in with Al. Now, listen. Come on. I'm coming. Don't push me Come around. On. I'm not your mother. Hi, boss. Hello, Doc. Nice layout here, Moran. It'll do. Sit down and pour yourself a drink. Thanks. How is the trip? Well, okay. Angie? She's getting to be a pain where it hurts. Yeah, I heard her just now. But like you say, Doc, sometimes she comes in handy. Oh, you want to, boss? No, I'll stick with it. But uh, you got to straighten her out, Doc. A dame around's okay with me until she gets to a point where she's liable to queer the caper. Uh, yeah, what about the caper? What's what's Al got set? It's good for ten grand. Not bad. Another bank? No. Tavern owner. Hey, I quit heisting saloons years ago. All right, now, wait a minute. Besides, what saloon has ten grand? Will you listen? Okay. It's a pretty good deal. Oh? This tavern's right near the big frigid air plant. Every payday, the workers come in the joint to cash the checks. So every Friday, this tavern owner goes downtown to the bank and gets ten thousand. No more, 
No less. Ten thousand. Now it begins to sound like something. Guy rides back alone from the bank. We nail him on the way. Good enough. Now, the thing we gotta do is know that bank inside out, the tavern, and the streets in between. Mm. Sounds like a cinch. Tell Angie to get ready. But, Moran, I now... know, I know, but I want to show you that tavern and we got a better look for myself. We'll take Angie along for the ride. All the way to Dayton to knock over a tavern guard. I'm warning you, Angie, you better shut up or you're going back home. Uh, and if I send you home, it'll be on your back. And remember that. Should be all right. Yeah, yeah, I'll be all right. Saloon bandits. <laughs> okay, now that's enough. This sounds too easy, Moran. Somebody goes to the bank with him. They got to... Al's been watching him three weeks. He goes alone. Well, then he sure carries a gun. If he don't, he ought to. What if he does? There'll be enough of us. Yeah, it's a big deal. I heard enough out of you, Angie. Go on home. That's a good idea. Why didn't I think of it? Moran, she better stay. I suppose I don't want to. Go on, get out. Well, good night. I think I'll pick up a guy. Maybe two guys. Uh, pick up... Whoever you like. Those two over there ought to do me fine. Hey, Angie, you go on home now. Nighty night. Hello, boys. Hi. You too, hello. Hello. Got a cigarette? Sure. Here, help yourself. Thanks. <laughs> That's my brand. Match? Yeah, sure. Much obliged. Don't mention it. You wouldn't like to buy me a drink, would you? Oh, we'd love to. I like rye, straight rye. But we were expecting our wine. Oh. Yeah, any minute. Some other time. <laughs> it's a date. Well, I guess I'll toddle along home. That's as good a place as any. Thanks for the cigarette. What do you think, Haynes? It was an accident. They didn't send her over. I don't care for that kind of accident. Maybe we're too close to him. Maybe. But we've got to take our chances. Come on, let's get out to the car. Hey. Hello, Andy. Get out of here. Nobody comes in my room, Moran, not without an invitation. I got an invitation. My own. What do you want? Here. What's that? A bus ticket. Get packed and get out of here. Now, wait a minute, Moran. Nobody's telling me where to go and when. I'm telling you right now to get yourself out of here, and you better do it before I let you know why. Why, you no good hoodlum. I'm coming up for your rotten tongue, Angie. Now, get packed. Doc will have something to say about this. Doc's already had something to say. He went down and bought the bus ticket. You rotten heat, I'll claw your eyes out. You okay, can't stop me. <laughs> now, get packed before you get more. Only worse. Dixon. Nice night, huh, Dixon? Beautiful. Girl got on a bus alone. Ticket at St. Louis. Okay. We'll have her picked up at Cincinnati. Yeah. That's the car, the Buick. You got a lot of nerve leaving a stolen car parked right in front of the house. Not so much. It hasn't even been reported stolen yet. Oh. Doctor, it belongs to us in Chicago at a convention. Well, it's a cinch they don't want a hot car around too long. Maybe tomorrow's the day. A month's pay, says it is. Yeah, I'd make the same bet. The lights are still on in the house. Moran makes his boys study late. Yeah, just walk on by. I hope we can stick with them tomorrow. We will. There's four extra men flying in from Cleveland. Good. We'll need them. I don't think Moran will give up so easily, even when he's through. Now we'll, we'll turn left at the next corner. Boys, a lot of traffic out more than we counted on. It'll be okay, Moran. Don't worry. 
The only thing I wish is Angie was here to help me spend my part of that guy's ten grand. Oh, for the love of... Will you stop yapping about Angie? Okay, okay. We'll take him at the red light. You ready, Al? Yep. All set. Doc? Am I ready for, for ten grand? All right, boys. I'll be following you. There's the light. He's stopping in a good place. Ray, fight back. Go ahead, but take your time. Do it. Right. Let's go, Doc. Right with you. You get that side out. Yeah. I'll take over the wheel. Hey, move over, bud. We'll take care of that package. You let him slide over this way. Okay, okay. But he don't shoot. Get your head down. All right. Lower. Or I'll knock it down. Yeah, all right. Okay, you got the light. Get his eyes tight. No, please don't. Don't tell us what you do. Now you'll shut up. Take him up good, pal. The less he sees, the better. Special Agent Haynes. This is Dixon. We got a bad break, Haynes. We lost Moran in traffic. No. It couldn't be helped. And they may be pulling the job right now. Well, no reports have come in yet. Well, look, Haynes. Get out an alarm on that stolen Buick. At least we'll have that to hang on him, if nothing else. All right. I'll put it on the teletype right away. Go ahead. Walk. Faster. But I can't see. That's the idea to tape, so you can't see. Go ahead. All right. How much farther? Walk, I say. <laughs> Get up. Get up, bro. Kick you so you really feel it. That's far enough. Leave him later. That's the boss. Yeah. Take him to that tree. But good. Okay. Everything going all right? On schedule, boss. On schedule. Where's the score? Right here. Uh-huh. I ain't had time to count it, but it feels like ten grand. If anything ever felt like ten grand. Well, let's get moving. Hey, you set? Oh, come on. Let's go. You take the wheel, huh? Yeah. Boy, we got any more like this, Moran? <laughs> a few. Just a few. Come on, come on, let's go. Okay, I'm coming. I'm coming. All right, get in. Well, Moran, where to? Back to the joint. But, boss, we ought to move. Yeah, I, I don't like the idea of hanging around like a couple of ducks for them to shoot at. Listen to Papa, will you? He knows best. Hey, Doc. Doc, wake up. <laughs> Somebody's tapping in the window. Mm-hmm. See? Mm-hmm. Holy... Hi, it's Doc. Angie. Well, I'll be... Get rid of that, Doc. Yeah, okay. Angie, what? Go over and open the door, Doc. It's four o'clock in the morning. I know it. If it wasn't, would I be banging on the window? Why ain't you in St. Louis? I'm not, that's all. Open the door. Oh, Moran knew you were here. He cut my head off. Open the door. Okay, okay, but be quiet, will you? Get rid of that, Doc. Get rid of her. Yeah, 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 okay. It ain't one thing with her, it's another. Never anybody. Oh, well. Now look here, Angie. What's the idea that... FBI, don't move. FBI? Just keep still and you'll be all right. Listen, guys. Where's Moran sleeping? In there. And Al? There, but he's not sleeping. You, you, take Al. But watch him. You hold this one here. Come on, Haynes. Right. Okay. All right. Open the door. Easy. Come on. The light. Yeah. Okay. Let's wake him. Right, Moran. Sit up. Hey, what's the idea? I like... said sit up. Hey, now, wait a minute. You... FBI, Moran, here's your pants. Get them on. You guys got no right coming here and hearing me. I got a right to my privacy. This isn't 20 years ago, Moran. Get those pants on or we'll take you in without them. 
So, Don, after nearly 25 years, the notorious Bugs Moran, once one of the most feared gangsters in the country, was finally convicted as a common bandit. Moran and his accomplices, Virgil, Doc Summers, and Al Fouts, were all given maximum terms of 25 years, which they are now serving in Ohio State Penitentiary. Well, thank you, Matthias H. Heck, prosecuting attorney, Dayton, Ohio, for giving us the inside facts into the amazing case history of George Bugs Moran. And gangbusters, congratulations to all the agents of the Federal Bureau of Investigation and Dayton, Ohio detectives who participated in the investigation and prosecution of this notorious criminal. Now, a special gangbusters presentation. Late Thursday night, a murderer was led down a dimly lit corridor in the Cook County Jail at Chicago. This murderer had a message to leave behind him. And a special gangbusters crew went into his cell to record that message. Here it is. My name is Ernest Gaither Jr. I'm here in the Cook County Jail with only 29 hours to live before I go to the electric chair. I was a stick-up man. That's what I was at the age of 16. I was a boss of a gang. I thought I was a big shot to uh, three grands in me, in my pocket at all times. But it was a great mistake I made for thinking that. You are not tough when you put a gun in a man's face and take what he has wet hard for. It don't take guts to do that. Any fool can put a gun in his hand and do wrong, but it takes a man with guts to get a job and work for what he wants. I am just so sorry that I couldn't see it this way until it was too late. Although my life will be taken from me, but my soul is going to rest with God in heaven. That will be my next home. And I am so happy that I am ready to go. A few hours after he made that statement, Ernest Gaither, Jr., paid the supreme penalty of the law. And now, in cooperation with police and federal law enforcement departments throughout the United States, the only national program that brings you authentic police case histories. Gangbusters! And now to gangbusters and facts that show the operation of our law enforcement officials in their war against the underworld. Gangbusters has a special narrator for tonight's case, former heavyweight champion of the world, Jim Braddock. The inside facts in the case of the Jersey Butcher Bandits. You know, Mr. Braddock, Gangbusters listeners usually expect to hear our case histories narrated by police officials. I know it, Don Gardner, and the name is Jim. The two detectives who worked on it are close friends of mine. One of them was my sparring partner. I saw them work for 48 hours without sleep and for weeks without taking a day off. So I called you up. I thought that I, as a citizen, should come and tell other citizens what our police are doing to protect us. Well, when you got in touch with us, Jim, we thought it would be a splendid idea, so why don't you go right ahead? All right, Don. Suppose we begin one day last summer. Several longshoremen were stretched out in the shade of large packing cases on the dock of the Hobart, New Jersey. They had finished their lunch and were waiting for the whistle before they went back loading the freighter that was tied up alongside. The conversation actually had turned to a subject on which they were all experts. Tell you that's what he did it in. Huh? 141 and 3 fifths. You're talking through your hat, Sud. You don't know a thing about it. Who don't know a thing about what? Where do you get off at being such a man with the figures? I'm telling you, no horse ever ran a mile of 16th in that time unless it was downhill and a truck was pulling him. Oh, you don't think so, huh? How about that, though? He says, I'm a liar, practically. Be a liar. Who cares? I care, that's so. 
No horse ever ran it in 141 and three-fifths. Okay, Suds, you got your opinion. How'd you like to back it up with a little cash? Sure, I like to back it up with a little cash. And you can look it up in any record book you got. You're on. For how much? You name it. Anything up to five bills. Okay, that's enough talk about horses. You mean $500? Well, you think I mean cigar, you All part. right, there's the whistle. Talk about it later. Let's get back to work. Oh, my back. Why do we always get tracked? 500. He never saw 500. Didn't I? I'll show you what. Duds. Never saw five bills. <laughs> if that whistle hadn't blown, it would have kicked you right in the face. Oh, for crying out loud, for what did I do? 500. What do you think we're working this dock wall up was for to show how much money we got? Now get to work. Okay, okay. I'll see you after the shift. We'll pick up Whitey and go over the deal for tonight. <laughs> Hello? Detective Sullivan? Yes? Mike Hoser. Sorry oh. if I woke you, Pat, but those boys have been at it again. Another butcher? Yep. They broke in the house, took $4,000 the guy had in his desk. <laughs> the butchers don't stop keeping so much cash around the house, they'll all be broke. Well, there might be an angle in this one. Yeah? We got hold of a fellow who lives down the street in the butcher. He saw a car around earlier that looked suspicious. Oh, what kind of a car? A cream-colored job, a sedan. A late model, New Jersey license. Oh. He got the last two numbers, 9-1, but that's all he could make out. They are. It's better than nothing. I'll get dressed and come on down, Hoser. Where are you? Chief of Regio's office. Okay, you wait there for me. I'll see you in 20 minutes. What a racket, what a racket. Butchers. <laughs> Just look where you're driving, Suds. We know it's good. How about it, Whitey? Did you ever see anything so soft? It's like standing out in the rain with a bucket. You can't help catching something. Suds, you put it quaintly. Listen to him, Phil. I put it quaintly. What was so quaint about that four grand tonight? All right, stop jabbering about it, will you? Let me just say we all go out and celebrate. You two go ahead. Just drop me there at the next corner. What's the matter, Whitey? Nothing's the matter. I've got a date. Yeah? With who? Oh, you don't know her, Phil. And I bet you you don't want to. Did you ever meet one of them tomatoes he runs with? What do you say we come with you, Whitey? I'll buy a drink. Oh, some other time. You don't mind, Phil. Not tonight. No, not tonight, Phil. He's all engaged. Stop. What are you looking for, Suds? Me? You want to let it go? Just stop the car and let me out. Stop it, Suds. Okay. You be in touch with me, Phil? I'll be in touch with you. Good night. Thanks. So long, Whitey. What's he thanking you for? How should I know? Get going. Okay, okay. Take it easy, will you? You want to buy me a new clutch? Good luck, Phil. Don't get sore at me just because Whitey ain't sociable. The guy's going to be a bailer. We ought to act like one. Not like somebody from a dancing school. All right, that's enough. Yeah. Well, what's he doing while we're breaking that back stock while up him? He don't like to talk to us. But I like to know what he tells those fancy dames of his. So just remember one thing. Without Whitey, we're not in business. No Whitey, no butchers. No butchers, no dough. Well, we can dig up some other guy. There's a million guys who can get information like that. Look, Suds, I'll take care of the personnel problems around here. You just drive. I want to get to bed. Hello, Chief Reggio. Hello, Chief. See, Sullivan. Thanks, Chief. Thanks. All right, now, what's this idea? Well, we thought Chief... he's a... <laughs> You tell him, Pat. <laughs> okay. Uh, Chief, we know the last two numbers of the car. We know it was a cream-colored job, probably a Dodge. Now, we want to go through all the Jersey registrations and see if we can't locate a car that fits that description with the last two numbers, 9-1. You know, there's over a million cars registered in the state. We know it, Chief. And that car might not even have been involved in the burglary last night. So you don't think it's such a good idea, then? Oh, just a minute, Sergeant. Who said it wasn't a good idea? These men have burglarized the homes and held up the shops of a dozen butchers. Their take has run to nearly a quarter of a million dollars. Is any chance at all of getting them, I'm for it. Okay, Chief. We'll get busy on the registrations right away. Uh, just a minute. Uh-huh. Let me call Trenton. I think their card sorting machines can save you a little work checking through those registration lists. I'm coming. Hello, Kay, honey. Whitey. Oh, Whitey. Let's never fight again. 
I wasn't looking for a fight, honey. I, I was in a bad mood last night, and I'm sorry. But you said you'd be here at 10 o'clock. It was nearly one this morning before you came. Hey, I, I had business. I, I, I should have phoned. I didn't. I'm sorry. Here, here's something for you. Flowers. Oh, Whitey. I love you so. Have you... You got a drink around here any place? Oh, sure. Whitey, let's get married. Let's get married right away. I'd love to, honey. <laughs> More than anything in the world. Then why don't we? Well... Well, what? I don't know. I, I can't, that's all. I know you do all right in business. You always got plenty of money. Well, money's got nothing to do with it. Then what is it? I, I've got to make up my mind about something. About what? Look, Kay, get me that drink. I've got to go. Go? Where? Business. I, I've got to go out on business. Whitey, if we're going to keep on, this has got to stop. I can't wait here night after night wondering whether you're going to show up or not. I... I can't sit around worrying about okay, you. Okay, don't worry about me. Don't even think about me. Don't... Oh, honey, I'm sorry. You're always sorry, wife. Yeah, I know it. Goodbye, Kay. I'll phone you. What about that drink? Forget it. I'm late now. So long. Sergeant Hoser speaking. Hello, Hoser. Matt Sullivan. Well, how are you making out down in Trenton? Okay, I think I've got something we can go on. I hope you have. They got another butcher last night. I was afraid of that. The guy in Cliffside Park, they took over 12000 from him. He was hiding it in a bookcase. Well... Uh, what did you find out? There's half a dozen or so cars that fit the description, but one looks really interesting. Yeah? Did you ever handle a guy named DeFelice? Philip DeFelice? I sure did. I sent him up about five years ago. Well, he owns a brand new green colored Dodge sedan. License number HO691. Well, that looks like a ticket, doesn't it? You said it, Hoser. It really looks like the ticket. Look, I'm leaving Trenton in an hour. As soon as I get back, let's make arrangements to grab this deep police with the goods. So, Don, Sergeant Hose and Detective Sullivan had their first lead to the criminals they sought. But they learned that weeks of patient waiting were ahead before they could make their move. Now, back to gangbusters and the former heavyweight champion of the world, Jim Braddock. Now, you were telling us, Jim, that Detective Sullivan and Sergeant Hoser had used a slim clue to trace an automobile observed near the scene of one of a dozen burglaries that had plagued northern New Jersey. That's right, Don. One night, the police and the criminal known as Suds were in a Hoboken bar, unaware that the two detectives were seated a few tables away. If you don't mind, sir, so shut up about it. Look, so why don't we have to keep worrying about Whitey for? Let's forget about the guy and do this on our own. Oh, get some sense, would you? Now, there's guys with dough besides butchers. I'll take the butchers, and so will you. They're in the kind of business where they can lay away a lot of cash, and they're doing it. Okay, but Whitey ain't the only guy that can get information. I know a guy in Bayonne. I know 40 guys in Bayonne, but there isn't one that's got Whitey's touch. We need him. So lay off, will you? I'm sick of that guy. Moping around all the time about a dame. One dame. How about that? All right, here he comes. Keep quiet. Quiet. <laughs> have to quiet him over the edges, will you? Well, hello, Phil. Suds. I'm sorry. Well, that's all right. Time don't mean nothing to us. Sit down, Whitey. Thanks. What do you want to drink? An orange blossom? Listen, you haven't had enough of your wisecrack. Yeah, college boy. Well, who All do you right. think? Get it out. Uh, now, listen to me. I'll tell you how we work the deal tonight. Before you do, Phil, I, I've got something to say. Well, get it off your chest. We got business. What is it, Whitey? I've been doing a lot of thinking the last couple of days, Phil. So? Tonight's my last job. I'm quitting. You what? I'm through. I'm quitting. Good. Glad to hear it, Suds. And, uh, why are you quitting? I want to get married. Well, get married. Who cares if you're married? You gave us another couple of months' work, Whitey. Now, once you're long. I'm through, Phil. After tonight. Now, well, let's buy a drink and celebrate. Suds, wait for us in the car. But, Phil, wait I'm... for us in the car. No. Okay. See you outside, but make it snap. Who's the girl, Whitey? Okay? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Nice dish. 
You, uh... You wouldn't like her to find out what you do for a living, would you? You crack a word to her, Phil, and I'll kill you, I swear. Don't yeah. make me laugh, Whitey. You're not the killing kind. You got more sense. We made a quarter of a million, Whitey. This is a big-time operation. Clean and safe. I want to keep it up. Remember that. Let's go. Tonight's the last one, Phil. Is it? Let's see. Hey. Wait a minute. What? He's an old friend of mine. So what? Wait a minute. I want to say hello to this guy. Okay, but make it snappy. Well, well, Sergeant Hoser. How are you? Hello, Phil. What are you doing these days? Oh, I'm a reformed character, Sergeant. You taught me a lesson. I'm working hard in the docks. Glad to hear it. I just thought I'd drop over and say hello. So long. So long. Got to get up early for work tomorrow. See that, Sullivan? Yeah, that guy sure got a lot of nerve. I think he's pretty sure of himself. You don't think he's wise that we've been on his tail? No, I don't think so. But we'd better stay away from him tonight. Yeah. Okay. That blonde fellow he was with, he's been around enough to be the third man in the room. Maybe. If we can get a chance to make a picture of him, maybe we can find out who he is. Well, if I see any chance to get that picture, I'll let you know. Come on. Let's call it a minute. Yeah. Waiter. Waiter. I don't know, Chief. I'd lay my bottom dollar it was them. They were in the neighborhood. Well, maybe, Sullivan. But there's nobody that can identify them. Uh, have you got anything more on the other two? Well, this one they call Suds. His real name is Carlo Rinzuelo. Ten arrests. Oh, robbery. excuse me, Sergeant. Yeah, sure. People right here talking. Hello, Chief. Sergeant Hoser. Yes, yeah, Sergeant? Is Sullivan around there? Yeah, sitting right here. Hmm? Just a minute. Sergeant Hoser back. Oh, thanks. Hello, Hoser. What's up? They're all at the Palisades Park swimming pool. All three of them? Yep. The third boy's with a girl, a good-looking number. The police and Suds got here a little while later. Looks like they're keeping an eye on the third one. No kidding. Say, look, this may be our chance to get those pictures. Yeah, bad it might be. But... Look, I've got an idea, Hoser. I'll go by the house and pick up my little girl. We'll be there in less than an hour. I told you, Kay, I'm getting things worked out. Maybe in another week or so. I don't understand you, Whitey. You're talking such riddles. There won't be any more riddles, baby. Everything's going to be on the square. Someday I'll tell you the whole story. Someday, maybe years from now. All right, Whitey. Someday. Oh, Whitey. Tell a guy you were going swimming. Oh, too. Such. How you doing, Whitey? Don't answer me. I see you're doing okay. Whitey, I... It's all right, honey. You don't mind if we sit down, do you, Whitey? Why should he mind? It's a public swimming pool. A little too public. Whitey's told me a lot about you, honey. Oh, that's nice. Yeah, I hear you kids are getting married. Very interesting. Okay, you've been sitting in the sun too long. Why don't you take a dip? But Whitey, Sounds I... good for a Whitey. Yeah, great. Makes it sand. Go ahead, Kay. All right, Whitey. Get cooled off. I'll be back in a minute. Whitey. Yeah? What's going to cool me off? Why don't you take a dip? There's a wise guy. No cracks. Okay, Suds. You know, Whitey, maybe you'll be a happy guy married. Maybe you won't. What do you mean? I mean, maybe you won't get married at all. No? Maybe I ought to do this Kay a favor. <laughs> maybe it's the right thing to let her know what kind of a guy she's getting. You try still, Whitey. Okay. Let go. You got a job, Sunday, Whitey. I want a lot of jobs after that. You're coming with us? Hold on, though. That's fine, Ivy. Now smile. Oh, shit. Smile, Be honey. quiet, wouldn't you? Ah. <laughs> 
Hey, no, we'll make sure. Let me try another one. Oh, for so crying out loud. Thank you, honey. Hold it. There. I hope the pictures are cut down. I think there will be your fine model. Now, remember, Whitey, you keep working or the dame gets an earful. Okay, Phil. If you say so, I guess I keep working. I guess you do. And keep that head on your shoulders. We got a big one Sunday. Come on, Phil. Now, all back to gangbusters and Jim Braddock, former heavyweight champion of the world. Now, you've told us, Jim, that Detective Sullivan and Hoser make some interesting pictures at a swimming pool. Yes, Tom. And as soon as they were developed, several victims intensified Whitey as a salesman who came to call on them. But meanwhile, other important events were taking place. Hello? Hello, honey. Whitey. Get your things packed, Kay. We're leaving tonight. Leaving? For where? I don't know. Any place we can get married. Oh, Whitey. I'll be by around seven, honey. Be ready. Well, I don't know what to pack if I don't know where we're going. Pack everything. We'll be gone a long time. Maybe for good. All right, Sud, stop here. All right. Oh, Sud, Whitey? Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. What do you mean, you guess so? I hope nobody's home. There's nobody home. I saw by myself. Come on, Whitey. Well, are you coming? Yeah. Yeah, I'm coming. Park it around the corner, son. Oh, Jay. And walk up to the house and knock. I'll let you in. Uh, All right, let's get inside, Whitey. There's about six grand in that house someplace. Take the side door, Whitey. Yeah. Yeah, the side door should be easy. Chief. What's up, Jose? Sullivan just called. He followed the three of them to the house on Bergen Boulevard. He watched them break in. They're still inside? Yes, Chief. He wants us to hurry right over. Your car downstairs? Yes, sir. It's all ready. Well, let's go. Whitey. What? When you stop daydreaming and help the suds look around for that dough, how long do you think we can stay in here? Okay, okay, take it easy. How about the china closet, suds? I looked in there. See if there's any packages pinned up in the back of those drapes. Well, go on and look, will you? Okay, I... Hey, get away from that window. Still! What? The cops! A thousand of them! You kid, get down. All right, both of you, crawl over here. What are we going to do, Phil? How are we going to get out? Shut up, will you? Stick on the floor and keep quiet. The three of you, come out. Come out with your hands up. The place is surrounded. Come on, let's get out. Keep your head down. Come out in ten seconds, or we'll fire. We'll go upstairs. We'll hold them off from there. We haven't got a chance. What are you, yellow? Yeah, what if I am? I'm no dope. Why, you... Get down. Hey. Machine gun. Who counted on machine gun? Shut up. Come on, Phil, let's give up. We're going upstairs. We're going to hold them from there. Come out. Come out now. Don't shoot. Whitey, don't shoot. I give up. Whitey, wait for me. Whitey, Sutch, come back here. Don't shoot. We give up. Hold here. Walk down here with your hands up. Okay, we're coming. We're coming. That's far enough, Whitey. Where's the police? He's upstairs, I think he went upstairs. Oh, my Lord. What a mess. You should have thought about that some time ago. Come on, Jose. Right. He's got a gun. All right, men. Hold it. Yeah. Stick the door open. Yeah. There he goes. Upstairs. Come on, Tom. What in the first room? Watch it, Jose. He'll shoot if he can. Don't worry. Okay. Come on out of there, Phil. Come on out. Let's go in and get him. Right. Push the door open and jump back. Come on out, Phil. Let's get him. Under the bed. Come on out. Okay, I'm coming. Take it easy. First, slide that gun out. 
Here it comes. Now you crawl out. All right. Take it easy now, will you? Just take it Up easy. Up on your feet. Up on your feet. All right, all right. We waited a long time for this, mister. Just walk. We're right behind you. And this time, we know where you're going. So done. So done, that was how Detective Pat Sullivan and Sergeant Hoser wrote a successful end to the case in which they spent weeks and weeks of hard work. The criminals were all convicted and received long sentences. Well, Jim, those officers deserve all the credit in the world for a really fine job. They certainly do. And I'd like you to meet one of them right now in person. Detective Pat Sullivan, meet Don Gardner. How do you do, Detective Sullivan? Hello, Don. We're certainly glad to have you on Gangbusters. It's a pleasure to be here. And before I forget, I've been asked to say hello to you and your Gangbuster audience by Detective Sergeant Mike Hoser. Well, you two certainly made a winning pair in the case we dramatized tonight. Thanks, Don. And we owe a lot to our chiefs, Joseph Steinell of North Bergen and Frank Burrell of Cliffside Park for letting us work together on this case. Oh, and say, speaking of uh, winning pairs, you and your daughter didn't do so badly either. That's right, Don. Little Eileen has always kept tabs on all my work. Well, you know, one thing puzzles me, Detective Sullivan. These butcher bandits during their criminal careers got away with about a quarter of a million dollars, and none of this money was recovered. Can you explain this? I think so, Don. You see, as the investigation went on, we learned that one of the criminals had bought two racehorses. One was named Caffeine, and the other Sweet Barbara. But neither of these nags ever crossed under the wire as a winner, even though the gang kept up a blind confidence. And that's where all the money went? Most of it, we think. The rest was used to keep them in their short-lived high style. And now, instead of looking at a race betting windows, they're all peering out of prison cells. That's about it, Don. Well, thank you, Detective Pat Sullivan, for coming here tonight and being our guest on Gangbusters. And also to you, former heavyweight champion Jim Braddock. It was a pleasure, Don. The only thing I didn't like about it was not being able to sit in my chair at home and listen to gangbusters. Well, that you can do next Saturday night, Jim. I'll be listening, Don. Good night. Leading roles were played by Roger DeCoven and Charles Irving. Don Gardner speaking. Gangbusters is a Phillips H. Lord production. And now, Gangbusters! Gangbusters, presented in cooperation with police and federal law enforcement departments throughout the United States. The only national program that brings you authentic police case histories. <laughs> Gangbusters and facts that show the operation of our law enforcement officials in their war against the underworld. Gangbusters has asked the Honorable John J. Sullivan, former Chief of Detectives and Deputy Police Commissioner, City of New York, to narrate by proxy tonight's case. The inside facts in the case of the supersonic safe crackers. Chief Sullivan. I know the criminals in tonight's case certainly presented a problem to detectives of the New York City Police Department. A tremendous problem, Don Gardner. But they gave the investigating detectives an idea of what their successors may have to face in the future. Well, it sounds like you've got an interesting case, Chief Sullivan. Why don't you go right ahead? All right, Don. On the west side of New York, a little uptown from Times Square, there was a cheap restaurant, a chili parlor, in the basement of an old brownstone house. Miguel, the Mexican proprietor, on occasion prepared his peppery native dishes for special customers. One such customer was Russ Enfield, who, on a particular night about a year and a half ago, sat at a corner table with his girl, Myra, as Miguel took up their order. Hey, and then I fix 
see some nice enchiladas, which we follow up with some nice cheese tacos. See? Fine, fine. That's what stuff make well. Can't you make something simple like ham and eggs? Ham and eggs? This is poison, ham and eggs. Go on, make well. Go on, go on. Whip the stuff up. Whip this stuff up? Well, this cannot be whipped up like that, like ham and eggs. Ross. Now, look, Myra, it's all settled. You got enough clothes. You can't have it. You know, huh? You know what I need. Yeah, I know what you need. Well, let's forget about it. Russ, I swear I'm not going to stand for this pushing around. There's certain things a girl's entitled to. You don't keep quiet about it. I'll give you what you're entitled to. Now, don't let's start it. Uh-oh. Comes Jonesy and the guy. Ray. Where's this turtleneck sweater? All right, all right. Now, keep quiet. Well, here we are, Russ. Hello, Jonesy. He looks sweet tonight. Yeah. Oh, I just got a haircut. Okay, okay. You're Preble, huh? That's right. Uh, Joe Preble, Russ Come on, Jonesy. Right. Let's go over to the bar and have a drink. Is it okay, Russ? Sure, sure. Go ahead. I want to talk to Phil. Take care of my enchiladas. Yeah, I'll see. They don't get cold. Come on, Mary. Those enchiladas couldn't get cold inside. There he is. Have a chair, Preble. Thanks. You kid. She's just like the rest of them. No problem? Sounds okay to me, Russ. The way Jonesy explained it. Jonesy's not the best explainer in the world. Have any questions? What kind of questions? Safe cracking and safe cracking. With a few improvements, yeah. For instance, you don't have to carry that gun anymore. Who told you I'm carrying a gun? Nobody told me. I just found out now. You carry it in a shoulder holster under your left arm. Right? Now, whose mind you been reading? I've been reading any minds. Just a dial on uh, this little gimmick. It's a funny looking watch. What is it anyway? Well, just a little gimmick I picked up. They used them in the war. Metal detector. Oh, cute. Cute as he come. But... How does it open a safe? Might come in handy, just like everything we use. The walkie-talkies, the supersonic stuff, everything. You gotta show me that it beats the old way. You've been on ice too long, Preble. You got a same-thing complex. Hmm. Now, remember what I tell you about the gadgets we work with. The scientific stuff can only go so far. Can't even go that far without a little head work. Okay, just lay it out. Now hold it, hold it. Senor Ross, you would like the tortillas plain or toasted? A toasted, I think. Yeah, anything, Mick. We'll just get it out here. I see, toasted. A toasted would be more better tonight because it's yesterday's tortilla. He should drown in a barrel of tequila. Well, Pebble, you think you could come along and do what I tell you without giving me any argument? Look, I've been knocking the knobs off safes 15 years now. I can use your experience, but my methods are a little different. What do you come to be such an expert in this science stuff? The Navy, pal. The Navy taught me the works before they gave me the bounce. Oh, another blue ticket, boy. Yeah. After a hitch in Portsmouth Naval Prison, I've got my hands on every electronic device in the book, and I know how to run them. Mm. I can open up any tin can of a vault in this town without straining a muscle. I'll show you what I mean. Now you heard there was fortunes being made out of government surplus. The surplus anybody can get, Preble. It still takes a guy to run it. Mm, here comes Agua Caliente with your grub. Good. Good. Let's eat. Well, you think you could crack this safe the old-fashioned way, Preble? I might, I might. Come on, come on, Russ. How long does it take to get that junk rigged up? Yeah, plug this in the wall sock. There. The old-fashioned way ain't good enough. Now you gotta crack a safe with gadgets. Think of the combination, Preble. Yeah, now you're talking. Okay, hold it. One tumbler dropped. It did not. I didn't hear it drop. I got the best ears in the business. It dropped, I tell you. And the gadget told me it did. No kidding. I'll run the dial back the other way. That easy. Yes, hey, what's that? Shut up. What is it, Jonesy? Keep the light lower, Russ. I got a glimmer of her from the window just now. 
Right. Keep that light lower, Prim. Uh, any radio cars around, Jonesy? Not a sign of one, Russ. How you doing? Okay, but we won't get it open if I talk to you all night. You just stay in the car. Keep your eyes out for cops. Okay. Hey, that's all right. The walkie-talkie's okay. I know it. Go on, get to work in that combination. Sure. Want to grab that dough and get out of here. Look, Captain Hanson, I hate to break in on the night like this. The sergeant, what's up? Just hit a call from the 32nd Squad. They got into the ball at the finance company office at 124th and Lexington last night. Got away with over 3,000. Does it look like the same boy, sergeant? No telling. Come on, let's get up there. All right. Ryan from identification down the way up there now. Dust the place over for Prince. Good. Walk off the way you came on. Go ahead, sergeant. Yeah. Uh, car is parked outside, Captain. We can... Oh, uh, Sergeant. Yes, sir? You say they fingered this safe open? That's what the 32nd Squad says. Oh. One of those boys must have awfully tender fingers. Probably took them all night manipulating that combination, just like that one last week, Captain. They could have blown the door off in an hour. I don't know, Sergeant. Maybe these boys have a way. A way? What do you mean, a way? Oh, we'll see. Let's get up there and look that ball over. Hey, Russ, I would... Oh, hello, Jonesy. Oh, hi, Myra. Is uh, Russ around? Sure, he's in there sleeping. He's got a night job, remember? Hmm. I guess I'll come back later. What's your rush, Hanson? You can wait, and you don't have to wait standing up. Okay. Thanks, Myra. Not over there. Sit down here. Over there? Cave, you don't mind. <sighs> Jonesy. Huh? Yeah, ma'am? Remember at the bar last night I was telling you about that dress? Yeah, yeah, it sounds nice. You couldn't let me have another 200, could you? Well, I know I owe you so much already, but you'll get it back every cent. Well, it's not the dough, ma'am. You've got the 200, haven't you? Yeah, sure, I, I got it, but... But what? Look, I, I told you before, Russ wouldn't like me giving you money. You know he oh, wouldn't. you don't have to be afraid of Russ. I wouldn't tell him anything about you and me. I'd like to get that dress today, Jonesy. Okay. You can have your 200. Ah, oh, Jonesy. I knew you wouldn't let me down. I just knew it. Myra, you, you belong to Russ. Now, Russ is a good-looking guy. He can talk and... And what? Skip it. You got the papers around any place? Maybe they got something in about the job. Oh, no, night. don't. Don't you think? Oh. Hello, Jonesy. Oh, uh, hi, Russ. Well, what's on your mind, Jonesy? Oh, uh, nothing important, Russ. I just want to tell you eight, eight o'clock is okay with Preble. He'll meet us at the chili parlor. Eight o'clock's fine. Oh, good. Uh, did he say anything about last night's job? <laughs> did he? He's really sold on this scientific stuff. Really sold. I, uh, think I'd better run along. But you hurry. Why? I've got something to do. You got some coffee brewing, Jonesy. No, thanks. Uh, see you tonight, Chili Parlor. So long, Jonesy. Bye. Well, did you have a nice nap? Lay off Jonesy, will you, Myra? What are you talking about? If anybody can see the guy goes for you like a ton of bricks. Been taking dough off him again. So what? You won't give it to me. I'm entitled to go look. Look all you want, baby, but just stay away from my boys. Want them to keep their mind on business. What do you think you are giving me orders? I'll show you who I think I am. Let go. I'll stop playing with Jonesy. I'll start on you, and I won't be playing. Captain Hanson talking. Hello, Captain. Sergeant Keel. Look, I'm with the chief engineer of the Euclid Safe Manufacturing. Well, what does he have to say? Nobody, he says. Nobody could open that new safe of theirs without blowing the door off. Did you tell him he was wrong? Did I? And I showed him the pictures, too. He still says that new model safe combination has silent tumblers and nobody could hear them drop. He says it looks like an inside job. I'm about ready to believe him. 
Is there any way at all to open that safe without the combination? Yeah, well, just a minute, I'll ask him. Is there any way to open that safe without the combination? The captain wants to know. Uh, they can only be through with a listening device. What? Oh, 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 yeah. Uh, he says they tested it, Captain. And the only way it could be done was you could hear the tumblers drop if you had a supersonic listening device. Uh-huh. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, that's interesting, Captain. But what kind of a burglar carries a supersonic, whatever you call it? I don't know, Sergeant, but come on back to the office. We'll see if we can find out. So, Don, as the gang of criminals led by Russ Enfield prepared to extend their scientific safe-cracking venture still farther, New York City detectives had obtained their first inkling to their method of operation. It was the beginning of a long trail that didn't end until the threat of death lurked on both sides of a skyscraper's skylight. Now, back to gangbusters. You were telling us, Chief Sullivan, that the uh, criminal Russ Enfield led his gang in a number of successful safe crackings by using such modern instruments as supersonic listing devices and walkie-talkie apparatus to warn of approaching trouble. That's right, Don. And New York City detectives had an idea of what was going on and were proceeding with their investigation. One night shortly before starting on a safe burglar they had planned, Russ Enfield had just finished dinner with his confederates and the girl Myra at the chili parlor the gang patronized. Listen, Russ, boss or no boss, this is the last time I go for this Mexican food. It can kill you. Yeah, it's like olives. you got to learn to like this stuff. And you will if you got a stomach left. Well, what's the matter with Mexican food? I like it. Okay, Jonesy, it's getting late. Drive Myra home, will you? Yeah, Russ, sure. Yeah, I thought you were taking me on this one. A dame's place is home. Who asked you? One home, will you? Come on, Myra. Now hurry back here, Jonesy. Pebble and I will have the whole thing gone over. Well, yeah. uh, have a good time, boys. Let's go, Jonesy. You sure. Hello. I'll see you later, Jonesy. Yeah. I, uh, got the car parked right outside, Myra. That's sweet of you, Jonesy. Look, Myra, I want to talk to you. Now, but... wait, wait, wait. Where do we get outside? Okay. I'll get the door. Hey, when I'm not it. Night, Miguel. Mm. Got warmer. Yeah. Where's the car? It's right there. Look, my right. Yeah. Your new dress looks nice, huh? Uh, does it? Glad you like it. Oh, wait a minute, my right. When is the payoff going to be? Jonesy, I told you you'd get it back every cent. Eight hundred, isn't it? When a guy gives dough to a dame, she means something to him, Mary. Oh, Jonesy, you mean something to me, too, but I'm, I'm scared. I'm scared of Russ. Well, I'm not scared. Come here. Oh, Jonesy, please. <laughs> Jonesy, if Russ ever lost it, you're having a good time. Yeah, Russ. An awful good time. What's the idea? No, wait a minute, Russ. Don't get thinking anything. We Shut don't... up. Come on, Russ. If you want to argue about it, I'm willing to argue. You think I ought to get socked? Try it. You're not going to get hit, Jonesy. Not you. Hey, now, wait a minute. Wait, nothing, Myra. I told you to cut this out. Russ, no, don't shut up. You had not have done that, Russ. She had it coming. Did I? I said you had not have done that, Russ. Go on, Myra. Grab a cab and get home. I'll take her home. You do what I tell you. Go on, Myra. Start walking. Don't you ever lay a hand on me again. You didn't have to hit her, Russ. You listen to me, Jonesy. Myra's no dame for you. If you want a girl, go get somebody else. Ain't that up to Myra? It's up to me. I came out to tell you to pick up an extra 20-foot extension cord for that job tonight. Now get it before we start something that we can't finish. Yeah. An extra 20-foot extension cord. Well, get going. We haven't got all night. Don't worry about Myra. I'll take care of her. Let me get this straight, Commander. You say these are all the types of supersonic listening devices that are Navy equipment? That's right, Captain Hanson. There are two or three other types, later developments, but they're still secret. They all look pretty bulky. Except this one portable job. The Army had some types of their own, you know. Yes, I know. I checked with the Army. Uh. That one's sensitive enough to enable a man using it to hear the tumblers in a safe combination drop. 
I've heard of instances where it was used during the war by the OSS and intelligence on certain missions in occupied territory, and quite successfully, too. I don't suppose these devices have too many industrial uses. No, Captain, not too many. Wouldn't be too difficult to trace all sales of them through the War Assets Administration. Well, when I leave here, Commander, that's exactly where I'm going. Come on, Marta, come on, open up this door. Hey, open up or I'll push it in. Hey, okay. All right. It's going to be part of it. All right, what do you want? What are you packing for? Where are you going? I decided a long time ago. No guy's going to slug me in and have me sit around to take his abuse. You sit around as long as I want you around. Hand me that pair of shoes. They go in too. Listen to me. <laughs> you hang that stuff back in the closet or I'll give you going over. You'll never forget. Jonesy will have something to say about that. I told you to stay away from Jonesy. Right, you stop. You'll do what I tell you. <laughs> you'll stay away from Jonesy. Get that through that head of yours. Now go on, hang that stuff up. All right. Put it that way. Yes, sir. Step right in. Yes, sir. What can I do for you? I understand you handle a lot of war surplus. You understand I handle a lot of war surplus. Mister, this store handles so much war surplus, I'm thinking of starting my own army. <laughs> What would you like? We got pup tents, jeep tents, bar tents, sailor suits, soldier suits, diver suits. Oh, uh, okay, okay. If you got any portable supersonic listening devices. We got any portable supersonic listening devices? Sure, we got them. Right this way. Thanks. Telling you we got a portable supersonic listening device the likes of which you've never seen. And they've been going like hotcakes, too. Everybody wants one, everyone. Huh? Uh, sure. We run them in, run them out by the carload. Hey, take a look at this little number. My name is Sergeant Keel. Safe and loft squad. Oh. Well, you don't say. It's a sergeant, huh? That's right. How many of these things did you buy from the War Assets Administration? Let me see. Ten, I think. They came with a job lot of other merchandise. Ten, yeah, ten. And they've been going like hotcakes? Well, not exactly. I saw one. One. Do you remember who bought it? Do I remember who bought it? I never forget a customer. Maybe sometimes I can't remember the face, but I never forget a customer. We got a record someplace. Uh, I'm going back and see what I can find out. Now, if you want to look around some of our fine merchandise for your own use, go ahead. Don't touch nothing over there. No, thanks. I think I'll just go in back and help you look. And then he hit you again. Huh? Yeah. But that's not the worst part of it, Jonesy. Like now, I can't even go to the beauty parlor without an escort. I'd like to help you, Myra, but what's the use? Nothing in it for me. You just run back to Russ. I hate him, Joe. You don't know how much I hate him. Then what are you sticking with him for? I'm scared. I'm scared to death he'll kill me. Jonesy. Hmm? There is a way. A way for what? For you and me. I thought you were scared of Russ. I suppose there was no Russ to be scared of. Now, wait a minute. Listen to me, Chauncey. That's safe tonight. There ought to be twelve, fifteen thousand in it. So? You and I could do a lot with fifteen thousand, Chauncey. An awful lot. Yeah, maybe we could. Russ told me he's taking both you and Preble up into the place with him. I'm going to stay in the car. What about Preble? He don't mean nothing to you, does he? Not much, no. Okay, then. Okay, what? When the safe gets open and you've got the money, that's the time. Both of them, I, I don't know. Well, you I... don't have to, you know. If you can do without me. Well, now, look, Myra. But it... if you don't kill him, Jonesy, we'll never get a chance, you and me. Never. Think of it. Fifteen thousand. Yeah, Myra. Yeah, I want that chance. Captain Hanson. Oh, Captain. Sergeant Keel. Oh, yes, Sergeant. How'd you make out? Well, it looks like this Russ Enfield's the guy, Captain. Got a pair of hoodlums for sidekicks. One of them is Joe Preble. Just finished 7 to 12 in Sing Sing. 
Good. I want them tailed, Sergeant. I want the man tailing each one of them every minute. Let's get him in the act of committing one of these safe burglaries. How about it, Sergeant? Been able to raise the captain? They're ringing him now. Captain Hanson. Sergeant Keogh, Captain. Talking from a call box on the corner of 93rd and 2nd. Russ Enfield and both his sidekicks just now broke into a building here. Oh, what about the girl? She's waiting in a car. And look, Captain. There's a finance company on the top floor of that building. That's probably what they're after. You got help on the way? Yes, sir. Plenty. Okay, grab them as they come out. Right, sir. And I'm on my way. I'll be there as soon as I can. So long. Captain John's way, Riley. Good, good. Now, look. That office is on the top floor. As I remember, most of these buildings around here have got skylight. Want to go up and have a look? Yeah, the watchman at that loft next door let us up and we can cut over his room. Okay. We'll tell Gordon to get the men posted as soon as they get here. Let's go. Come on, Jonesy. We've been here long enough. Come on, let's get packed up and going. Trouble. I'm set. You know, Russ, I wouldn't be surprised if that adds up to 15 grand. Yeah, we'll see what it adds up to when we count it. Now, come on, get that stuff together. Russ. What? Myra told me you hit her again. What business is that of yours? It's my business, all right. Is it? I told you, you hadn't ought to go around hitting people, especially Myra. Oh, forget it. Get that stuff together. Sorry, Russ, but Myra said okay. you don't move, Russ. Now, what's the idea? You too, Preble. Up, up. Yeah. Put that gun up, you dope, before I... Okay. Hey. All right, hands up, old folks. Okay, don't shoot. Drop that gun. Okay, don't shoot. Yeah, yeah. Not me, you don't get. Stop, you hog. Not me, you don't oh. get. Oh. Oh. Yeah, not yeah. me, oh. you rock. Oh. No, no, no. Now, look, Hopper, look. Just take it easy. I got him, Sergeant. All right. All right. Wasn't any sense running, Russ. All right. You've gotten yourself killed. A scientific mind like yours had a reason we'd have every exit covered. Okay, turn around and walk back to the safe. We want to look that job over. That dawn was how Russ Enfield and his gang learned that not even a clever application of up-to-date scientific instruments can beat the law. They were all sentenced to long terms, which they are now serving in various New York State penitentiaries. Well, I was amazed, Chief Sullivan, that such equipment as supersonic listening devices could be purchased by burglars. Well, they can't anymore, Don. Because of requests by law enforcement officials and for other reasons, the sale of supersonic equipment was frozen by the War Assets Administration several months ago. Well, thank you, Chief Sullivan, for this extraordinary case history. And congratulations to all the New York City detectives who had a hand in breaking up this dangerous gang of safe burglars. <laughs> Leading roles were played by Chuck Webster, Elspeth Eric, and Bill Zucker. Don Gardner speaking. Gangbusters is a Phillips H. Lord production.